On today's podcast, we're excited to introduce you to Kemper Creations Mobile RV Services. Whether you're a seasoned RV enthusiast or a newbie to the open road, Kemper Creations has you covered for all your mobile RV needs, providing service to Southern California RVs for over seven years. Specializing in electrical diagnostics and repairs, AC systems, generator diagnostics and repair, solar, charging, and just about anything else RV, Kemper Creations is your one-stop shop. So whether you're in need of routine maintenance or facing a significant repair, Kemper Creations Mobile RV Services is the team you can trust. Visit them at Yelp.com to schedule your appointment today and start enjoying your RV the way it was meant to be so you can feel confident using your home away from home effectively. That's Kemper Creations Mobile RV Services. Hi, everybody. I'm Josh. And I am Alyssa. Coming at you with the next episode of The Podcast is on Fire. And it wasn't my fault. We look into the good, the great, and the problematic in the Dresden Files series by Jim Butcher. Today, we're looking at chapters 20 through 27 of book two. Full moon. Mm-hmm. Right. This is a very eventful s- set of chapters. Yeah, it's a, a lot happens in a, a short amount of time. Um, mm-hmm. And, it, you know, I talk a lot in the Stormfront about how much of the process was moving the pieces around the puzzle. Mm-hmm. Um, and how it was a little bit obvious. Um this one's a lot less obvious. You know, this is this is more natural. The story flows a lot better. Um, so I think already you're seeing a more mature, just a more experienced author mm-hmm. um, as far as how you know, you still have to get the pieces on the in the right spot on the on the chessboard for the climax, but it doesn't feel like it's tape by numbers here, you know what I mean? Yeah, very much so. You're right. I get, and, and I appreciate that. But you're right, you're right. The the writing does get has gotten a bit more uh complex i guess the storytelling not necessarily the writing because uh in the last last time we were discussing about how uh the climax and the that climactic battle scene in the middle of the book is something that normally would be done at the end but the way the story is rolling it kind of works that we didn't we had a big big battle scene but it didn't resolve really anything other than killing one of my favorite characters I mean. <laughs> besides ruining our lives besides, besides um, absolutely depressing me for four fucking days you know <laughs> what i seriously was shocked when he died uh anyway i will i will probably still be mentioning that nine or ten books from now you know it would be really good here if carmichael were here you know just saying <laughs> but carmichael would know what to do carmichael would be able to handle this <laughs> It's fantastic. Uh, I feel like it's one of those you, you never know what you get, how good it is till you till you lose it. You know you don't know what you know what you got till it's gone with with Carmichael. But um, yeah, now it's it's just interesting. Like I yeah, I touched on it last week, where it wasn't out of place. It's just strange narratively to have this huge battle sequence in the middle. And you know, don't be wrong, we're, it's a Dresden Files book. We're not going to end it without some action here at the end. But um, you know, we, we've already blown the big action budget um, at, at the police station. This is well, going to be a lot, a lot more subtle. So I worked, as a, I worked as a set customer on a sci-fi channel show a million years ago. And it was not a big budget show, but we did car chases. They had, uh, it was the Invisible Man, so they did a lot of the special effects. I'm like thinking about that when it was, because I was listening to the pod to kind of seeing where we were at. I think it's going to totally be done, like, moderately low budget if anybody works for Stu siegel and wants to do this i would totally be on board with helping storyboard it i'm just saying <laughs> or if you need a set costume or costume designer i'm in i'm just saying just saying anyway that was my past life before i became a dead body person <laughs> the tangled webs we weave all right so yeah so uh we, we had the big um blowout action sequence and that's actually where we're going to start this week even though we kind of um, chapter 20 is a weird place. Um, we touched on it in the, in the, uh, 
you know, the, the recap at the end last week, but we uh, cut it out of the pod just for time. Because uh, we talked too much. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, we went two and a half hours and there was there was a lot on the cutting room floor there. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's a genetic problem. We both the, have it. At the very least, you know, it's people passionate about what we're talking about. Uh, um, but yeah, no, we definitely, uh, well, when, when we get on subject, we get going. <laughs> We're not gonna. We're just gonna basically copy paste kind of the recap from chapter twenty in it at after this uh, conversation here. Um, you know, the long and the short of it is, Alyssa didn't love that one. No, she did not. She had made sure she said there were some great elements in it, but in as a whole, she did not like it. <laughs> yeah, my favorite part about the whole chapter was. That it ended. He tried. Uh, yeah, I like the. <laughs> that was pretty good too. I like. I like the attempt. I, you know, he, he tried something new, um, and it very clearly didn't work. You know, like I said, it, it was trying to get Harry both at his lowest point physically, while also being aware and conscientious enough that he can solve the puzzle. So. It's just a difficult task. Um, like I said, I don't think they did a good job of it. But um, basically, um, okay. Puzzle, puzzles all but solved, and they're being followed. Um, here, so like I said, we're gonna we're gonna throw in chapter chapter twenty here, um, where he just left the police station after all the hullabaloo down there and all the the death and destruction and terribleness. Um, you know, Murphy was crying last we saw and just kind of lost her mind. Obviously, um, a lot of people were probably doing that. The police were had, and the uh, or the fire department and the paramedics had just arrived on scene, trying to figure out what they can out of the chaos. And you know, Susan escorts Harry from the premises, and he falls asleep. And uh, he's in the back seat of the car, kind of having himself a somewhere between a dream and a vision, a hallucination. <laughs> that too. And that's where we uh, start off chapter 20. And my notes of this. You said you really love this chapter, right? Um, Literally, <laughs> all caps in bold. I hate this chapter. Horrible expo dump. And not well executed. <laughs> it's not yeah. great. It's, it's, it's all an exposition dump. I don't like how it's done. It feels forced and like a really bad movie with somebody having multiple personalities. This is definitely a, a recurring thing that happens. I don't really know how to describe it. Is he a character? Um, but like it comes up and it's it, it's kind of Harry just doing the introspection. And it, I don't know, it, it is already a first person narrative. So it would be easy to have him just looking at, you know, the board with the, the string. Um I think it's just trying to do its, you know, kind of chart its own path a little bit. We talk so much about the tropes. I don't that's, think he wanted it to be entirely exactly. all tropey because I, I don't think that is a challenging or b really impressive at a certain to a certain point. Yeah. I do like how he weaves in some of the, the cheesy lines. Um, it definitely kind of comes out of nowhere and like scene breaking, book breaking scene. Um, okay. Okay. So, like, like you were, you were saying the. That that this is a, a trope that we're going to encounter, and that really worries me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, it's more elegant. It because this is really irritated the hell out of me. It just well, stood out like a sore thumb too. It's definitely kind of like one of those scenes that is like certainly not fl flowing through the novel. It, it definitely, like you said, it's 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 a sore thumb. Yeah, um, and there is a lot of exposition here, but one of the things that I like is. Everything that is, they talk about, or, you know, they, whatever he talks about, um, has been brought up already. So this is, again, what it, this isn't, nothing new happens here. They're, they're talking about, you know, he's breaking, again, he's breaking down the information he already has. So it's not really, an, I wouldn't call it exposition necessarily. It's, I mean, it is, but it's, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's not giving yeah, us it's new just, information. It's kind of rehashing stuff, but it's also kind of setting us up for the ending. Um, I don't hate it. I don't love it. It's definitely not one of my favorite chapters at all. I'm just trying to give it a little bit more credit because it's it is set up like they do mention Elaine earlier you know it, all, everything is kind of they see they do seed this properly it just doesn't pay off well no, that makes sense 
I, I think it was he, it was a good it was a good attempt. It just fell flat in the end. But there, I like that I like that he like sprinkled this stuff in and kind of like pulls it together in that moment. Like like I said, like it's it's the detective staring at the wall with the red strings and you know figuring out um, who um, Kaiser Sose is. You know, like oh my god, you know, it's like you know the, the detective figuring it out. But it's just he's also we also need him to be at his low point physically. It's just. It's trying to do too much, and it doesn't work at all. I agree. It does not work. I just, there's something, I want to give credit to the attempt. It is trying to do something a little bit more. I don't like it. I don't like, I don't like this style of writing. I don't like this style of scene building. It just don't like it. No, no. Yeah. Fair enough. Is that, I think I'm try, trying to yeah. devil's advocate a little bit here, but I also like, Again, yeah, like I do like that they I, they do sprinkle through, and it, it makes it's not new information, which wouldn't make sense, right? If this guy gives him new information, that's certainly a problem narratively, in, in every sense of the way. But it doesn't at least break the lore. It's just not done well, and I, yeah, I agree. It's not it's not a great it's not a good chapter. Oh god, it's sure. not a great chapter. I don't hate it. I don't hate it as much as you, but it's definitely not. Uh, but and one of the things. I know my double said, believe me, I know. That's why it's important to get some of this out now before it settles in, before you blow a gasket in your on your sanity, man. I'm not I'm not worried about it that I lied. Sorry. I'm not worried about that I lied. I'm as solid as a brick wall. My double snorted. If you weren't getting pretty close to crazy, would you be talking to yourself right now? The entire book is Harry talking to himself. So this is the only part of this chapter I like. And it's a, it's with Murphy and, you know, he's sees a vision or whatever would happen to them. The police station needs, what have I done to you? And my double knelt on the other side of the apparition. Nothing, Harry. He said, what happened at the police station wasn't your fault. Like hell it wasn't. I snarled. If I'd been faster, gotten there sooner, or if I told her the truth from the beginning, but you didn't. My double, my double interjected. And you had some pretty damned compelling reasons not to. Ease up on yourself, man. You can't change the past. Easy for you to say, I snarled. No, it isn't, my double said quietly. Concentrate on what you will do, not what you ha should have done. You've been trying to protect Murphy all along, instead of making her able to protect herself. She's going to be fighting these kinds of things, Harry, and you won't always be there to babysit her. Instead of trying to play shepherd, you need to play coach to get her into shape to do what she needs to do. But that means telling her everything, my double said. The White Council, the Never Never, all of it. And then he says, you should ask her out, which I was just like, are you hurt me? You're impressing big time, man. This is all getting way too Freudian. I mean, a lot of that I don't like. I, again, I don't have a problem with the you should ask her out part. I, I really don't. I, like, nah, it's I don't. But just how he's like, oh, this is all getting way too Freudian for me. Uh, it's just kind of it, that was a weird douching. Yeah, it's it's not again, it's uh, not it's not good at all. I, but I, I again, I, just going back to that conversation, like I said, I, I touched on it a, a bit ago. We're like, hey, you're you're allowed to like be a human being and have sexual thoughts and exist. And it and that like that, I don't think that's real. I mean, it, I don't think that's sexualizing her because we've seen throughout this novel that he cares about her as a human and he looks at her as a as a, a human being and that is you know his friend and someone he you know cares about. So I don't think the idea of asking her out is necessarily objectifying or sexualizing her. Well, I don't think it's yeah. identifying or sex sexualizing her, but it's just kind of like a little cliche. And then going on to talk about Freudian does go, you know, circle back around to sex. <laughs> no, it, it definitely does. How's the cards uh, uh, real quick? Yeah. Well, then they many mention Susan and, uh, you know, and it's, there are other ways that this could have been done. And it, uh, it's just, it, I just, Throughout both novels, Harry does go over things in his own mind. He goes back and forth. In this one, he's done it several times. Uh, and he mulls over things. And because it is in first-person narrative, that mulling is acceptable. Even just the moments where Barconas offered him that contract. He goes through the steps. He mulls over it. That's part of the reason why it bothered me. We've already done this. We've already seen Harry being able to mull over things. We didn't need this this device. It's a force device in my mind. It bothers me. Um, 
And the other thing is, I don't think we've run into the real killers yet. The ones who ruined McFinn's circle and whacked the mob guys on the non-full moon nights. Which is... Which... What makes sense... But then Harry says, you think so? Harry, this is your inner mind. This is your inner thoughts. Why are you questioning it? You obviously have that thought somewhere in there. Uh, he, Bob kind of mentioned that, right? When he said he, it takes a long time to learn how to be a wolf. You're, you're you know, from a bipe, bipedal you know, eyesight to a quadruped, whatever, olfactory or hearing, whatever it was. Um, yeah, that's kind of, I like that he put it together in his, in the, his mind. Again, I, I don't think that's necessarily exposition i think that's something that is oh yeah it's, 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 it's not, it is bad it's not good i just I, I i think i just want to give him credit for attempting something completely different it just yeah. doesn't it doesn't come off I mean, yeah. this was a very distracting chapter it took me out of it i'm i was listening to the audiobook and i was just so annoyed the other one too where it's like there was another moment which bothered the fuck out of me where it's like who are you my mother my double snapped his fingers. That reminds me, right? Your mother, he broke off. Oh, hell, then somebody's trying to wake him up. That's so fucking stupid. Though I do like how Tara's, you know, uh, is he awake? I'm awake, sort of. What is this? This better be good. What? This better be good. It is not good, Tara said from the back seat. If you have any power left, wizard, you should prepare to use it. We are being followed. All right. Um. So... Uh, back to contemporaneous podcasting. We are hop hop over to chapter twenty one here, and uh, it starts off with some really good terror a really good terror moment. <laughs> uh, there's a couple actually good terror moments here, but um, he wakes up. He's like, All right, yeah, give me a minute, give me a minute. He's like, Harry, I'm almost on empty. I don't know if I have a minute. He said, "It never rains." Tara frowned at me. It is raining now. She turned to Susan. <laughs> I do not think he is coherent. <laughs> oh, it's a figure of speech. Hell's bells. You really don't know anything about humans, do you? Hell's bells that we're getting so familiar with. Another one. Now that I know, it doesn't bother me as much. Yeah, it's just an in-universe curse of, you know, costs, basically. Yeah, and I appreciate you explaining that to me. Yeah, uh, so, are you sure there's someone following us? She's two cars back, and three cars behind that one. Two vehicles are following us. Uh, and she, she describes them as they move like predators. They move well, and she feels them. He says, you feel them on an instinctual level? And she says, I don't know, I feel them. They're dangerous. <laughs> it's just like, okay, um... <laughs> Uh, I just love everything with Tara. Um, I like her a lot. So he tells Susan to, uh, yeah, she's just great. He t he tells Susan to get off the expressway. He says, I have to in the next couple of miles anyway. What do you want me to do? So he tells her to pull off and get to a gas station and call the police. Yeah, she's like, but uh, what? <laughs> we just left the police station. You're, they want to arrest you. They want to keep you. <laughs> so just trust me. But Sarah, Tara says, wizard, there's no one but you who can help my fiance. So I'll meet you where you held your Cub Scout meeting. <laughs> Which I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly, she doesn't have a problem with the clo colloquialism there, probably because they are, she kind of made, maybe thinks of them as cubs, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Puppies. I understand what you are doing. I would do the same for my mate. Mate? Mate? I am most certainly not, Susan said indignantly. <laughs> he didn't get to hear the rest because he grabbed his blasting rod and the potion and he opened the door, unfastened the seatbelt, and he tucked and rolled. <laughs> this is, I literally wrote down John McClane action hero moments. We gotta stop calling everything a John McClane moment. Sorry, I love Bruce Willis so much, and Die Hard is one of my favorite action movies and the best Christmas movie ever. But it's very much like that, like, that, well, I put John McClane and then, I, I decided, okay, it's an action hero moment. It's very much an action hero moment. It's going to be then it was tucking and rolling out of the car, except how he describes how he rolled out of the car is not action moment -y. <laughs> There's going to be a drinking game for every time we, we mention. Every time we mention John McClane, Star Wars, Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry Potter and Die Hard. Uffy and Die, exactly. And we're going to be responsible for most of the alcohol death, <laughs> alcohol-related deaths in the Western seaboard. Um, 
what is, is this an eastern seaboard? Is western seaboard a thing? I don't know. Uh, uh, it's a, I don't know. It's a western coast. I don't know. Western seaboard, western coast. Because we have beaches here. They don't all, up along the, the eastern seaboard, they don't actually necessarily all have any beaches. I think they're just cliffs, right? They have some beaches. Yeah, but Florida, not like our beaches. Florida goes on and on about it. Um, Myrtle Beach, isn't that somewhere over there? Yes, it is. It's in one of the Carolinas. One of the Cackalackies. All the Carol... Uh, one Carolina is the same as the other Carolinas. It's like, <laughs> it's like the Dakotas and the Virginia. Actually, West Virginia, I got a lot of love for. Yeah. Um, fuck that confederacy. We're going to make a new state. Um, right. You know, last week, I think, was our first angel reference, which I'm going to count. Yes, it was. It was our last our first angel. I'm going to count as separate from Buffy, but for the drinking... Uh, 100%. Drinking game purposes, maybe it counts. We'll have to we'll have to figure out. We'll have to look at the rule book. Oh, <laughs> uh, I know, I know. It sounds really stupid in in retrospect, even to me. But it made a sort of chivalrous, cockamamie sense at the time. That retrospect thing bothers me. FYI, that's coming back at the end at, during my crackpot theory. Excellent. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I literally have that. I have highlighted it in my notes. And have okay, interesting. Uh, <laughs> I, I was theory. pretty sure that Parker and his cronies in the street wolves were shadowing us. And I had a precise idea of how dangerous they could be. I had to assume they were even worse during the full moon. Susan had no idea the level of danger she was in. And he didn't trust Tara. <laughs> right? Tara, I actually put, uh, do we trust Tara yet? Question mark on that chapter. <laughs> Turns out we'd rather bounce out of a moving vehicle than dress Tara. Or protect Susan. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was both. That was I literally on my yikes section. It is reasonable protecting Susan, double underlined. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I, I think this is a, a, but you know, it's, it's, this is less like, oh, I got to take care of the woman and more like, I've put yeah. myself and the That's people I care about in a very dangerous situation. Like this one, I don't think is page. I mean, there's certainly some patriarchal, you know, pay in there. I don't think this is as patriarchal. I think this is more. No, not at all. I don't think it's. It, I don't think it is patriarchal. Okay, yeah, and no, I, it's, it's. I, I'm a wizard. There's some, there's some spooky, exactly. scary stuff chasing us. Like I, I'm going to try to deal with it, and she's going to go get the cops, and hopefully it works out. Yes, and I. Uh, I'm a wizard. I have knowledge and skills that she does not have. And I don't want to ask myself that question as to whether I let her die so one of us survives like he did in, during the toad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, he actually is. He is making the same cho same choice he almost made. He's, well, it's better that one of them lives. And that is. Yes. Yeah, I love. And and this time he's he's her. choosing the flip yeah. side. Okay. Yeah, she's we, living. We, we we talked about that last week. He's 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 chosen to be a hero, and this is this is entirely yes. heroic. This is you could you could tell he, he gets less sexist and misogynistic the more fucked up he gets. And so he's got his ass beat yeah. here. The more injured he is. Yeah, so the more injured he is, the less the less misogynistic he is, and the more heroic he is. And so he's got his ass beat. This is I'd be yeah, you're right. This is all hero Harry. Yeah, I love it. Hero Harry double H H squared. Not like AJ Chomps, though. Not like who? AJ Chomps? The guy who had the murder house at the Chicago World's Fair? I mean, never. That heard sounds. Of... Oh, yeah. well, that sounds awful. I don't do real oh, murder. Sorry. I think it's You're historical. Crying. It's historical. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. He would literally had like secret secret hideouts. And, yeah. Um, anybody who listens to true crime understands what I'm talking about. Uh, but no, it's a historical thing. It's a Chicago World's Fair. He's one of the first documented serial killers in America. It's pretty fucked up. That's the H card. Fair enough. And <laughs> wanted to deal with the pursuers himself. To deal with his own mistake. So I uh sort of threw myself out the passenger seat of a moving car. Don't look at me like that. I'm telling you. It made sense at the time. Again, there's uh Playing around with the tenses there. That's an... That's... I lo well, we will revisit that, my friend. That bothered me immensely. We'll revisit. We'll revisit. 
Um, there's a couple uh, paragraphs in there about him trying to, you know, how he's tucking and rolling. Um, <laughs> oh, it's just more fun ways for Harry to get his ass beat. But as soon as he stops rolling and bouncing, he hops up, he pops open the sports bottle, and he's got himself a potion to drink. And this is when I our a bottle maintained its its seal when he tucked and roll. Because he had to have rolled over it a couple times. Like what kind I really need to know what kind of sports bottle he is. Is it one of those Gatorade ones with the pop-up thing? They have to pull up my yeah. teeth. I really need to know. Yeah, he describes the other ones as like, you know, one of those where you could pull up the uh little nozzle. Uh-huh. Um but he grabbed it and his blasting rod, so I'm assuming he kind of tucked those close to his chest. That's spectacular. Um, specifically to protect those because those are the two things that he, you know, kind of needs the most. Yes. Those are his important bits. <laughs> He's got a lot of important bits. He does have a lot of important but, bits, but those are the two most important bits right now. Yeah. Um, but it, again, just a cool, uh, this was a lot less dynamic kind of the potion, but mm-hmm. still, still a cool description of how the different potions work. Um, you know, as it as it went down my gullet, I could feel the power of the brew spreading out into me, active and alive. Um, as if I'd swallowed a huge hyperkinetic amoeba. Um, just kind of the power spreading through him, all the fatigue and the pain and then all the little niggles just going away. Um, and he's back, baby. Um, this is this is what he wanted: a night's sleep in a bottle, uh, and he's feeling refreshed and ready to rock. So. He uh, turned towards the access road and he sees the car coming up. <laughs> and he just blasts the... Uh, he explodes all four tires at once. So spectacular. Another brilliant cinematic moment. Oh, yeah. So he just explodes the tires. The car ends up flipping and rolling. And he says, well, then. That should take care of that. Mm-hmm. And of course, anytime he gloats, you know he's about to mm-hmm. get smacked in the face, which is a theme that comes up all the time. <laughs> but he's being punished for gloating. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The universe does not let him get away with gloating very often. And I appreciate that. That's one of the things, though, that about how Butcher, especially with Harry, where he's he'll be like, oh, we cool, we good. And they say, oh, just kidding, we ain't. <laughs> <laughs> It's great. So good. And uh, basically, you know, they just kick kick out the glass and climb out of the, the vehicle. It's just rolled over a, half a dozen times. Uh, they start walking up there and they're fine. Um, one of the one of the dudes he calls Flat Nose, he's the guy that whose nose got busted when he visited the garage the other day, um, starts shooting at him and Harry's uh, shield bracelet, you know, basically makes it, he's not shooting at all, nothing mm-hmm. doing. Uh, but Parker, you know, punches him or hits him and says, like, remember while we're here, he's mine. Uh, yeah, man, remember from the last time, from that soul gaze, that Parker, the leader of the street wolves, the lycanthropes, um, who I, I don't love and really don't need to be in this story at all, I don't think, um, needs to kill Harry to kind of reclaim his grip on the pack. He's getting older, his grip was slipping, and then Harry kind of showed him up the other day when he just waltzed in there after being sent there by the bad FBI guys who tried to kill them the night before. Uh, I'm sure that doesn't have any sort of connection or anything like that. Mm. Uh, that's where we're at. There's a flat nose and there's a woman with him. They come up and Harry basically just kind of brushes them off with his power, um, which is really cool. Again, just him basically just dominating the scene. Um, kind of, you know, just with a little brush of will kind of knocks the woman's uh, weapon aside and he blocks the bullets with no problem. You know, he, he says that the uh, police are coming and Parker's like, well, they're, they're coming to get you too. He's like, well, yeah, but when they get here, I'm going to have disappeared. Just like, gosh, I don't know, magic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And you know, Harry starts to get a little bit cocky with this, you know, realizing he, he's won this. So this display is really cool, but we, we come to see that the potion 
wears off very quickly. I mean, Harry is gassed. And so the potion can only do so much. Um, and the street wolves kind of, I think they gather that he's not as powerful as he's letting on. Um, and so they kind of keep creeping at him, even though, you know, he's shown some power and they're, they're wary of him for sure, but they're definitely not scared beyond the initial thought. And, you know, he, he's, he pulls up, ends up pulling out his gun, his, his 38 special. Um, and it's just something nagging him. He, he, he's, he's like, I keep, I realize I for, I'm forgetting something. Um, and then what's, he tries to use magic and it yes. doesn't work. He points the blasting rod and says, Fuego, which should shoot a lance of fire. And instead, it does nothing. That's scary. Oh, yeah. Again, like when it, this is, Harry talks so much about how important magic is to, to his being and, and his identity. Um, mm -hmm. And it's failing him right now. And so the, 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 the Harry has a couple more wisecracks and stuff, but then he realizes all too late that, um, you know, as, as Parker tells him, there were two cars behind you and someone smashed down on his right hand, making it go numb, sending the gun to earth. He looked up to see another lycanthrope from the garage with a lead pipe blasting him hard. Um, a crazy woman screamed and rushed towards him. She had steel-toed steel boots. Flat nose lumbered after her. He was content to use the barrel of his pistol as a dumb club. Parker just sat there, squatting on his heels. And this quote is... Great visual. The visual on that, where you have the calm Parker just kind of doing the little papa squat. Yeah. And then somebody coming out with him with a lead Ugh. pipe. This is always like so difficult to picture for me these types of scenes because mm -hmm. I don't mean like picture as in you know use my imagination to make the words come to life, but I mean even in a movie like the line between you got big old hunks of metal and you're blasting this defenseless dude at a certain point you you are just gonna kill him and try to find the balance between beating the shit out of him and not killing him. How do the lycanthropes find that discipline? I, I have a hard time believing that, quite frankly. Um, I think part of it was that, that Harry has Harry isn't a normal human. That's fair. We, he is just skin and bones, though. He's not a big dude. Um, yeah. But uh, this is, quote, just... I don't like thinking about what they did. They didn't want to kill me. They wanted to hurt me. And they were good at it. Uh -huh. I couldn't fight. I couldn't even curl up in a ball. There wasn't that much spirit left in me. I could hear myself making choking sounds. Gagging on my own blood. Sobbing and retching in pathetic agony. I would have screamed if I could. You hear stories about men who keep silent through all the torture and agony that anyone inflicts on them. But I'm just not that strong. They broke me. Ugh. That sounds like fucking hell. I, and, it, and, the, and here's the thing. They're beating the fuck out of him. Parker is ten feet away, crouched, like, squatted down. Watch. And the rain, and the rain is falling. That's the other thing. The, the rain is falling. At one point, Harry talks about that it's either rain or blood dripping into his eyes. Yeah. Like, holy shit. That's some crazy shit. But this 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 scene, the way the action is, it's a it should be a cacophony of motion. But the way it's written is that it's slow. And he's just taking this beating. It's really, this is a pretty well-written scene. It really is. Oh, it's great. And I do like that um, Harry goes to the, the same place I go when you start talking about dead bodies. Mm -hmm. at, some point, the, <laughs> at some point, the mind says no more, and it gets the hell away from that. I started to go there, to that away place, and I wasn't sorry to do it at all. <laughs> it's a nice spot. Anytime the, the viscera comes up, I just drift away. 
Yeah, sorry. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> you know, I'm not a I'm not a sane person. Uh, eventually, Parker. Oh, where am I, my friend? Parker pulls him off of him, and they throw him in the trunk. Um, I like the description where, as they were throwing him in the trunk, he wasn't looking anywhere because he couldn't like move his head or his eyeballs. He was just like. He was so tired and and broken, he couldn't move his eyeballs. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, just like literally the position where they throw him and where his eyeballs happen to be, he saw Harris, the red-headed FBI forensics guy. I don't like when gingers are bad guys. It's really inappropriate. <laughs> I don't have a skull. Gingers don't have a skull. I'm well aware. Um, <laughs> but Chauncey never gives me anything. Um, Sedan rolls by, but he, see, he sees uh, that Harris is tailing either himself or the street wolves. Um, beyond, behind the gag, I started laughing. I couldn't help it. I laughed, and it sounded like I was choking on raw sewage. What does that sound like? That doesn't make any sense and talk oh, gross. No, it's no gagging no and it's just vile. No, thank you. No, thank you. Um, the pieces had all fallen into place. That was my pieces clicking into place noise. Yes, and I have that line highlighted as well. <laughs> I'll come. I'll come back to that. All right, chapter twenty-two. Harry's passed out. This chapter starts. Did you just see Harry's passed out with a weird accent? Harry's passed out. Harry's passed out. Harry's passed out. I over on the. Come on, Harry. Harry. Right. Harry. Happy Christmas, Harry. Harry. I, I can do this all in an in a English accent. I can do it in an Irish accent as well. Um, do not judge my fake accents, people. I, I can do it in an angel-style Irish accent. Oh, the angel-style <laughs> Irish accent is so bad. It's so good. I love Southern. Um, anyway, I can do Boston, too. So this no, chapter... You no, you cannot. I can pack the kind of habit yet. Are you sure? No. I really uh... think you're mad. I'm enough of a Patriots fan that I listen to enough of the New England broadcasts that I can have. Hey, I am totally hey, doing Tommy, 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 and Gronk. Trader, <laughs> Jesus, like an A, like an A. People download this on purpose. <laughs> I know, and I love it. We are magical humans. We are magical humans. Because I think the thing is, is that we have a weird sense of humor and a weird perspective on the world, and there are a lot of other people who do as well. All right. Chapter 22. Harry's passed out, and this chapter starts. There's just... it. I, I lo So again, I'm, I read too much quotes. I read too many quotes, but whatever. There's a point after which one cannot possibly continue doing complicated things, like thinking and keeping one's eyes open. Blackness ensues, and everything stops until the body or mind is ready to function again. The blackness came for me, and I welcomed it. It's just so freaking good. Motherfucking, motherfucking Jim Butcher. So good. Oh, um, anyway, so he wakes up and finds himself restrained in a the garage of the Full Moon gang, all our friends of the werewolf variety it's full moon garage the name of the location yes full moon garage and uh he is duct taped like you because do. he has around his back mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and this is i uh, okay, this i put in my notes that it's a really interesting juxtaposition of the things he's discovering as he wakes up um but he is cynical as ever after all it would be a real pity to die when I'd finally put tabs on who had gotten me into this mess, as well as who was responsible for the recent killings that couldn't be attributed to McFinn, and probably who had set him up as well. It's just, he's still cynical. It would be a real pity to die. And I, I mean, I love that cynicism. That's one of my favorite things about him, is his cynicism and bitterness to some degree. Um, but... The the next thing that I'd really notice about this is the juxtaposition of the dirty blanket, the clean blankets, the dirty sock. And then he has a blood transfusion going. At least that's what it's kind of uh, described as, even though this is not how blood transfusions actually work. You said it was an IV. 
It's an IV that blood is dripping through. Is it blood? That's what I thought it said. Um, I just assumed. There was also a little stand with a mostly empty plastic bag of what I took to be blood, dripping down a plastic tube that vanished behind me out of sight and presumably ended at my arm. That's not like it. It sounds like it's a blood transfusion, but blood transfusions don't work like IVs. FYI, if you ever need to do a blood transfusion, it's not like an FYI. It's not like a IV. Anyway, um, but this is where we get more really spectacular descriptions. Where you know my legs have been duct taped together above and above and below the knee at the ankle. My foot, my bitten foot, had been wrapped in clean bandages, then covered with my bloody sock. In fact, I found a number of clean bandages on various cuts and scrapes, and I could smell faintly as though my nose had been given a while to get used to it, the sharp medicine smell of disinfectant. I couldn't feel Murphy's sawed through handcuffs on my wrists, and I found myself vaguely missing them. At least they'd been familiar, if not comfortable. It's kind of great, like he, but he's still looking for that, con that contact, that connection with Murphy. That kind of says a lot, in my opinion. Yes, uh, it's funny. It's two. It's we're two books in, mm -hmm. and we haven't had a major conflict go by where they, him and Murphy, are together. But mm -hmm. feel her absence, which t speaks volumes. You know what I mean? Like with, like yeah. the way he describes her absence means he expects her to be there in these situations. Um, and that just again, she's kind of like tells you about their relationship without telling you about the relationship. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the important part where we learn about them without being told directly. Uh, and this is, uh, again, in my notes, I said, action movie shit. <laughs> my hands are bound and I didn't have any way of making a circle. He's talking about making a circle with his chalk. He he doesn't want to use. He needs delicate magic. Okay, so he says, without a circle, I couldn't use any delicate magic to free myself. All I had access to was the kaboom sort of power, which, while great against nasty loop guru and other monsters, isn't much good for getting rid of several layers of duct tape resting within half an inch of my own tender skin. Magic was out. So then there's a whole section that I will be referencing later in my crackpot theory. Okay. And we get this kind of this again, his action movie shit where he's trying to loosen the tape so that he can pull his arms and legs apart and break out of it on a moment's notice. It's very, that's very much an action movie. It's his action hero moment. I did not say die hard. So you <laughs> do not have to drink on this moment. <laughs> you did now. I did now, but okay. I didn't. I didn't talk about Bruce Willis. Drink. <laughs> anyway, so as he's trying to like wiggle himself out of this shit, uh, we see him find that uh, Parker and Dude Bros Flat Nose come in. Um, the other thing that this is a big, I have this is a big question mark. It's in my question section. Uh, he says Parker says. One, we don't do it without having the others here to see it. And two, we don't do it until Mar Marcones had a chance to see him. Why can't we do it with the others here? Is that proof of life or is it some weird ritualistic thing? No, he wants the others to see him take his vengeance. Okay. And he's just, I'm like, mm -hmm. my, understanding, my understanding is he's just trying to, red flag, red flag. He's just trying to reclaim power, his power over the pack. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we learn a little bit about the Parker Lana conflict within the uh within the pack. And but one thing Parker says, Parker says, I kept you in cash, in dope, women, whatever you wanted. So settle down. This is one of those things, if you've ever watched one of those documentaries on like Hell's Angels or whatever, that's how they keep their members in line. Cash, dope, women. So while these are not bikers, they're equating the werewolves to like the Hell's Angels, angels or the Mongols. Yeah. I which I really found very interesting and kind of cool, though. It's a great comparison. Yeah, no, that's definitely what they're going for. This is supposed to be kind of biker gangy. But it's a supernatural element. 
I really just liked how they used that. And it wasn't blatant, you know, but it was cool. Like, it makes you wonder, well, shit, are the Mongols called the Mongols? Because they're like werewolves. <laughs> I like it. I mean, are Hell's Angels actually demons? You know, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. But, you know, that was the sort of, that's where my mind went. I was like, oh, that's really cool how he did that. Um, and so Flatnose is challenging Parker. Parker's telling him he's going to rip his heart out. But the one cool thing, the description by Harry is... The way he spoke the threat was eerie, not with the hissing, villainous emphasis one would expect, but in a calm, measured, almost bored tone, as though we were mentioning switching out a carburetor or changing a light bulb. So he was just, I told you, you were never good enough. Challenge me again. In public or alone, it doesn't matter. I will rip your heart out. Just laissez-faire. I mean, that's even creepier than he says, I told you, you were never good enough. You know, that sort of shit. Like, it's cool. The way it's written is very cool. Uh, and it works. And so then, you know, Harry's like, fuck, he can't just run because these motherfuckers will catch him. So he's like, okay, what if I provoke him into leaving to get a weapon? And then I can run. Doesn't quite work so well. But he says at one point, he says... um, that he didn't have time to be picky, which I appreciate. But he lifts his head up enough to squint at him in semi-darkness and says, You certainly have a way with people. You must have read a book or something. <laughs> and, you know, because Harry's just suddenly talking, kind of startles him. And he's spun with the reflexes of a nervous cat. Great description. And uh, this is a kind of funny interaction. So you're alive. It's just as well, I suppose. Mostly I was just tired. Thanks for the sack time. He showed me his teeth. No problem. Check out is in a couple of hours. That scared me enough to make a rational man pee. But I only shrugged. No problem. Good thing your people can't hit. They might have made me uncomfortable. Parker laughed a rough laugh. You've got balls, kid. I'll give you that. At least until Lana's get Lana gets her teeth into them later. So, Lana likes to bite people. Lana probably is a vicious, vicious bitch. Uh, but he also, Harry throws it back at him. And he says, enjoy it while you can. I hear your people are getting a little sick of you. <laughs> Do you think Lana will be the one to tear your balls off when they put you down? That definitely encouraged Parker to kick him in the head. Uh, Parker also repeatedly calls him kid. So we're giving this... Descri that again we're separating Harry from Parker Parker is older but how much older is Parker because Harry called Ren uh what's his name the kid from the the the, the rookie called him kid Rudy. but they couldn't have uh, Rudy sorry Rudolph uh he called him kid so there couldn't be that much age gap there so this is an interesting again it's that condescension well, yeah, it's 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 con it's condescension. Remember, we like we know Harry Parker could also be older. Harry's 25, 26, and we know Parker's older because he's graying, and he's he's too old, so the pack is starting to turn. Yeah. Him. So Parker, I think of Parker is in like in his sixties. Okay, that uh, works. That works. That I think we it, just don't have a ton of description. No, I agree. But I, I think the uh, it's the the Harry calling Rudolph kid the kid really stuck out to me, and I didn't like it. Um, mm -hmm. like I said, I, I, until we looked it up, I think it wasn't even episode two of Stormfront. We didn't even look it up at the beginning. Uh, maybe it was, but where we realized that, uh, Harry was supposed to be 25 in that one. Yeah. He seems older in Stormfront. He seems older now. So I could see him calling a rookie cop a kid, but 25, Rudolph's not a kid. He's got to be. No. Tw what? Well, if he's a rookie, he could be 21. Yeah, but still. But still. Uh, you know, uh, come on. Um, but uh, this makes more sense for him to call him a kid, although he is doing it to be condescending for sure. But this is like, I think this is an old, an older man, way well past his prime. Yeah. Talking to, you know, a guy in his mid 20s. Well, and I think too that um, 
that that makes sense and i can kind of see him as the the, the ragged older man in the biker gang <laughs> okay moving on all right so you know he's trying to kind of push parker and instead of leaving so instead parker just spun on his heel picked up a tire iron and turned back to me lifting it high Fuck Marcone, he snarled, and fuck you, wizard. <laughs> and this is a great description of this his physicality. His muscle his muscles bunched beneath his old t shirt. As he raised the iron above his head, his eyes gleamed with the same sort of animalistic fury I had beheld in the other lycanthropes the night before. His mouth was stretched in a feral grin, and I could see the cords in his neck standing out as he wound up to give me the death blow. I hate it when a plan falls apart. <laughs> this is, I literally put an, put a note. Ending chapter 21 and 22 lines are perfect. The pieces had all fallen into place. And I hate it when a plan falls apart. But also, I hate it when a plan falls apart is a total A-team thing. Oh, see, where I love it when a plan comes together. So, I, I mean, I, I mentioned it a lot. We I coach youth sports. I coach a middle school water polo team. And um, my references are all incredibly dated, and most of them don't, they don't get mm -hmm. any of them. Um, yes. Like, to put on weight belts, I do, I say discount double check, which is a reference to a yes. mid-aughts <laughs> State Farm commercial, um, where Rogers, Aaron Rodgers, after they won the Super Bowl, when he would score a touchdown, he would display and show his title belt, like a WWF or boxing title belt who do kind of put his hands together over his waist and like spread them out to show I got my belt on um and so in this some one of his fans in the State Farm commercial started calling that celebration the discount double check whatever he sold it he's the first guy to ever sell out his touchdown celebration which I think is ingenious uh <laughs> make money yeah, of shit. late stage capitalism baby um but uh, so when they put on their weight belts, I tell them discount, kind of double check. But very regularly, when something works, I say I love it when a plan comes together, um, like I have a cigar in my mouth. And mm -hmm. um, again, the kids have no idea what I'm saying wait, for any of them, but they're now used to my references. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I do the uh, Hannibal all the time. <laughs> That's spectacular. I love that so much. I gotta keep myself uh, excited at least. Oh, I used to make references all the time when I worked in the jail and everybody, not everybody, but a lot of the people I worked were younger than me. And we'd work with all these deputies who were like 12. And I'd make references to movies from, I don't know, my childhood, the early 2000s, and they'd all look at me like crazy. Yeah. But it, though I have made like um, Adventures in Babysitting references, you know, <laughs> fuck with the babysitter. And um, yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. Don't fuck with the babysitter. Don't fuck with the Lords of Hell. Don't fuck with the babysitter. Yeah. I make references to a lot of movies that nobody gets. It's magical. Yeah, well, imagine working with a seventh graders. Well, no, that's you can what you can. Um, it almost feels worse though when they're your coworkers. That's fair. You are working with seventh graders, basically. <laughs> they're just also adults. Yes. Um, oh my god, I love it. All right, so. Uh, it has been about an hour since, an hour and about four <laughs> wine glasses for Lissy since no, chapter I, 22. Uh, um, ch but we're going to pretend- like 26 minutes. Okay, bro. And we're going to pretend that we just uh, immediately stopped talking about chapter 22 and moved into 23. Hashtag Boop. podcast magic. <laughs> so right before Parker's about to blast Harry and end this charade of a life, um, you hear- Mr. Hendricks, if Mr. Parker does not put down the tire iron in the next second or two, please shoot him dead. Yes, sir, Mr. Marcone. Hendricks rumbling basso answered. <laughs> That's another character. So spectacular. I got a soft spot in my heart for like all the like fun side recurring side characters. Mm -hmm. Why, you know, Carmichael and uh, I love uh, Hendricks. Hendricks. Hendricks last spectacular. And I, I I bring this up. It is kind of spoiler, I guess, because the other we've met three Marcone um, goons in in Stormfront, and two of them are already dead. Um, you know, Hendrix stays with us for a while here. We uh we can get to know this guy in like one grunt at a time. <laughs> um, but him and Harry's relationship is great and antagonistic. And there's another character that comes in that he's just their intersection is fun. 
Um, but I like Hendrix. Um, but uh, Marcon is there. Hendrix is there, uh, you know, with him, obviously, in a much cheaper suit, holding a pump-action shotgun. Um, in his meaty paws. I like that description. Um, Parker's face snapped around, but uh, Marcon's like, that's a 12 gauge, 12 gauge riot gun. I'm fully aware of your rather special endurance at this time of the month. <laughs> Mr. Hendrick's weapon is loaded with solid slug ammunition, and after several rounds have torn literal pounds of flesh from your body and ruptured the majority of your internal organs, I am reasonably certain that even you would perish. So I have that not... entire section highlighted because I thought that was spectacular. And it's gross enough that you would highlight it, but still cool enough be... <laughs> um just Marcone just being like, I, 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 I run things. I am in charge of literally every situation. So shut the fuck up. Put the tire iron down. Let's do some business. Um, I, actually, I actually made a note in regards to this chapter. Marconi knows shit. Because he does. Oh, yeah. Marconi knows shit. For I mean, he has power. And we all know what power is. He has power outside the human range of things. I'm just saying. I meant no knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. so, Keep going. Oh, no, no. I have like seven or eight little notes regarding this chapter about Marco. <laughs> this would be a great quote that I've, I've seen it before. But it's, it's often falsely attributed to Oscar Wilde, I think. But the uh, um, everything in life is about sex. Except for sex. Sex is about power. <laughs> that's pretty spectacular. Uh, everything is about sex. I didn't know that was, I didn't know that was attributed to, to Oscar Wilde. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, no, it's um, unknown. That's accurate. Yeah, no, no, it's nobody knows who it is, but it's one of those that, uh, you know, like Einstein and Oscar Wilde and Voltaire and oh, God, Mark, Twa Mark Twain. Mark yeah, Twain. Mark Twain said everything under the sun. And 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 Ben Franklin. Between Mark Twain and Ben Franklin. And some of the most inappropriate things, you're like, oh, no, no, that was definitely him. You know, that, actually, those ones were probably. Actually, probably, probably him. Because, yeah. My favorite is the, uh, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I love that. Um, so he puts the tire iron down, obviously. And uh, he says, my people are coming. If you try more of that heavy-handed shit, I'll have you torn apart. And again, Marcone just smoothly controlling literally everything almost like with a superhuman vigor they are coming but they are not yet here their motorcycles have all suffered flat tires quite mysteriously we have time to do business perhaps i don't know marcone has a special sort of power just saying no oh. because we just saw everybody's tires get flat his own oh, interesting say i did i've never made that connection yet. i love it i literally have what well, remember airs question mark how question mark powers question mark but evocation needs line of sight we do know that right yes so he and, may have had a line of sight for these motherfuckers sure and he may have but just you know he couldn't have done it from this room or anything like that you know what i mean no um, Thalamaturgy, potentially, but he'd have to have a connection to each tire or something of that. So, I'm, uh, again, that's that's what we know about mortal magic. Again, potentially, there's access to other things in different parts of the Never Never in the universe. Um, also, perhaps Marcone's just a dude. Um, all sorts of opportunities here for question marks. Um, he brings up his faded green dollar bill eyes again. There, I think there was a meme. I, what, he does. I want to say it was on TikTok. It may have been on Reddit. I don't know. It all bleeds together. Oh my God. There's TikTok for Tristan? Uh, yeah, the podcast was on fire. It's actually oh. a... Uh, yes, we are on TikTok, but like there's other TikTok? So there, there's actually a couple a couple that are like um, really good, but uh, I don't know. All right. I got really dork. I geeked out about it's, that for way too Honestly, much. not as many people as you'd think, but uh, there's a couple... I, brought, I don't remember her name. There's one... Uh, who's just a creator, who's just crushes. It's like, uh, awesome. You'll have to send her to me when you call her down. down. And I actually, because I love it. I think that's fantastic. There's just a meme about, like, Harry, like, Harry. Harry's more than, uh, Harry's into Marco. Like, no, I'm not. Like, what color is eyes? 
color of faded, quite faded dollar bills. Yeah, oh my god! The afternoon it's sky. It's so romantic. He's exactly. having a very romantic description. Um, and he's coming at this again. Yeah, yeah. See, um, it's just funny. I mean, so Marconi has pretty eyes, is what we're learning. Faded, faded dollar bills. I got parried to some of uh, a friend of mine. I'm like, mm. his eyes were the faded green of dollar bills, and Does his opaque have is glaucoma <laughs> or cataract. That feels more like a uh, medical issue. <laughs> I'm thinking like a like a Fifty Shades of Grey uh, kind of description. Oh, maybe a little opaque as mere. Like you know exactly what's going on in his head. You better than anyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, hi, John. I said you've got good timing. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that this dude just saved his life, and the first thing he does is poke at him. Well, and then Marcone says, "And you have a way with people, Dresden." <laughs> Marco smiles. Yes, of course he does. Which is creepy as fuck. You know it is. Mm-hmm. You know that he said, glancing at the silent Parker with unveiled amusement. You must have read a book. I'm already reasonably certain as to your reaction. But I thought I would give you another chance. You must have read a book. Uh, who also said you must have read a book? Maybe I don't know a chapter ago. Who said that? Harry? Harry tells Parker that. You must have read a book. They use the same insult. Oh wow. I I did not pick Oh up yeah, on that I, I wrote I heard the first time I, I so I li- the way I do this is I listen through the book and then I read through the book. I take notes as I read. And the first time I heard it, I was like, oh goodness me. Holy shit. They're both you read a book. Wow. Holy crap. What's the connection I mean, again, there? We, ta- we talked about it earlier that Harry and and Marcone, despite everything they would like to tell you, is they are the same person. They're very similar. Uh, <laughs> but, um, or yeah, obviously, they're similar. They're not quite the same as not fair. But I just, that's really yeah. interesting. I um, noted that another very chance, specifically. Another chance to what, Eddie? He's, uh, Harley McFinn discovered his personal number. And was pissed off. He thinks that Marcone destroyed his circle. Um, so I'd say you've had it then, John. Hartley can be quite, can be fairly destructive. Um, and yeah, oh, great. Marcone surprises him by says he's a loop guru. He's like, how did you? The report you gave to Lieutenant mm-hmm. Murphy, such things have to be paid for and thus copied and filed and copied and filed. It wasn't hard to obtain a copy for myself. Well, money's not going to buy off Harley McFinn. Yeah, and quite. This is the other part that I fucking loved. Did you note this part about the silver? Oh yeah, no, I I love it. The idea he just... doesn't have inherited silver. Yeah, his back bears, God rest their souls, were in no position to leave me anything, much less silver. Love um, just the fact the fact that again, like Marcone comes out in a different way, but him and him and Murphy both. Like, Harry, it almost, like, doesn't believe that people will believe him. You know what I mean? He's he's been a wizard for so long that, like, clearly, like, wizard, you know, magic's not real, so people don't believe wizards. But he was surprised that Murphy read his report. And, you know, however Marcone, however Marcone got it, Marcone read the report and knows what's up to. It's just kind of cool. Um, yeah, he is, people believe him. But uh, I want to make a deal with you. The same stipulation as before. Um, and this is the part. That I love. Uh, in addition, I'll promise you, give my personal oath that I'll see to it that the pressure is taken off of Lieutenant Murphy. Uh, obviously, he wants to tell him to go to hell like he yeah. did earlier. But... Yeah, but tell him to go to hell if it were regarding him, but regarding Murphy, he thinks about it harder. You know, would he, though, in this case? I'm not sure he would, because even if Marcone didn't explicitly say that about Murphy... Harry knows he can still help uh-huh. and do good. I think he might spend more time on it. I, I think Harry might end up agreeing in this case, just because of the situation is literally he's going to die immediately. Uh-huh. Here. Um, but I agree with Murphy. It's like he doesn't even have to think about it. Like, yeah. yeah, it's a done deal. Like, I have an opportunity to help Murphy. I don't give a fuck what it costs. Which says a lot about his relationship with Murph. Again, you know, we talked, or we talked last week that he's literally talking about the price of his soul. Right. And and 
you know, I, I mean, I kind of joked about it in the, uh, the episode notes last week where, um, and we took you know, we talked about it on air, but I, you know, I, I have very, I'm not a writer. So when I have an opportunity to write shit, I try to have a little bit of fun with it. Um, but you know, I mentioned last week that Marcone and Chauncey both go shopping for one wizard soul. Yeah. Yes, you do. Um, that was, what was at stake in this contract? And he knew that, and it was very clear to us, the readers, that that was what's at stake. And he obviously said no. Mm-hmm. But now, he's going to say yes. As a ploy. Sure. I think it's as a ploy, though. Sure. Because him saying yes distracts Parker. That's the biggest thing that I noticed, is that he said, I will s- get me a pen. And it's it's very much to distract Parker because Marcone says I, you don't you needn't worry Parker he won't accept my offer he'd rather die. I lifted my head up and kept my expression as blank as I could. Give me a pen. Give me a pen. I'll sign your contract. Anything to get away from these animals. We know as readers Harry's not going to actually sign this. I see. I don't know. Oh, that's kind of what I was getting yeah, was that whole thing. I, I, the I, way he popped his head up and was like, oh, motherfuckers, give me a pen. Give me a pen. So him him using the anything to get away from these animals. Mm-hmm. Remember what his plan was in the last chapter was to get him so pissed off he makes exactly. it stay basically, right? So that does lean into that. But I really too, truly believe that when push comes to so- shove, if his opportunity is, if his choice is save Murphy at the cost of his soul... Mm-hmm. or die and, you know, Murphy. I think he would sell his soul for Murphy. That, you know, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I think he would. And he, w- he wouldn't do it for himself, but I think he, and again, we say sell your soul. This isn't siding with Chauncey and literally giving your soul, but it, it's your, that's what you're doing when you sign on with Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's, it's going to cost him his relationship with Murphy for sure. Mm-hmm. But I think he would it would be worth it to him to do that. And that's why I, I think it's he's also, you know, he's using all the tools at his disposal. And, you know, he immediately tries to do the Venta Servitas. Nothing happens again. Um, you know, he's he's trying to get out of it any way he can for sure. But I truly believe when he says, I'll sign it, if that's his way out, he'll I sign think it. it's his manipulating. I think he's manipulating the the ploy again. I mean, and it be, because remember how he went when he told us about Susan that it's so easy to get people to do what you want them to do. I think this is a similar situation where it's so easy to get people to do what you want them to do. He doesn't have that kind of power over Marcone. But Marcone is no in- intimidated by him. We learned that earlier. Marcone is intimidated by him. Somewhat. Yeah, Mar- Marcone definitely is wary. Sure. It really, sure. That, that's kind of was my impression of this, where he's like, oh, he's pulling all, all, all the deep shots. Interesting. That's, that was, yeah, no, so- and Marcone, like, he literally says, the gears were spinning in his head as he tried to work out what I was doing. He couldn't. What is moving? Yeah, yeah, he couldn't figure it out, and I love that. And then Parker, it pisses Parker off. Wait, what were we trying to do? Oh, we were trying to piss Parker off. So, but I mean, let's work this through. I mean, obviously, we don't find out. We'll talk about why we don't figure that out in a second. But like, let's work through this hypothetical. I mean, Parker screams. Okay, Hendrix kills him. Flatnose comes in. Okay, Hendrix kills him because Hendrix is motherfucking Hendrix. Hen- to dodge to one side too quickly for a man of his size. He's a linebacker. Is he, though? No, but he's built like a linebacker. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think, again, remember what my, I don't know, crackpot theory has been for, I don't know, since week one? That Harry's... No. That Mark Cohn... Uh, psychic. Has other yes, I know, that's... Powers. And I think that the people around him have other powers. And Mark Cohn has those powers perhaps hendrix is not human either yeah, i don't no one in this universe is human. no nobody's human nobody's fully uh, human <laughs> but again I, I, wa- I want you to work through this 
hypothetical. But I literally highlighted that about Hendrix. I was like, Hendrix, question mark, question mark, question mark. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I like that. I, I love that. That That's a great pickup on that line. Again, like a lot of these subtle lines, these are the things I just blast through, whether it's Marster saying it or my dumb brain combining words and saying things like, you know, jump side hit smash. Mm-hmm. Um, I get all the all the onomatopoeias I, I, I get. Like, or a Batman calm. Um, but my point is, my question is, goes back to that whole this. Parker's gonna freak out. Mm-hmm. We were expecting that. Sure. Go on. Mark say, Mark Hendricks restrains him, say or shoots him if he doesn't kill him. Mm-hmm. Is Harry signing that contract? No, walking out of it? No. So what's he doing? He's manipulating the situation. Oh. He's saying that so all hell breaks loose. Because okay. Him saying that pisses off Parker. Parker freaks out. Hendrix starts shooting. So okay. Harry can go hide. So I've already told you, again, this is describing the situation. I'm not, you haven't read this because this isn't, I'm not reading from the book. I'm describing mm-hmm. a situation. Parker says, no, fuck that. He's mine. Mm-hmm. Hendrix shoots him. He's down on the ground. Hendrix fucking, you know, gets a headlock on him. Okay. Is Harry signing that contract? No. What's he doing then? Harry's Harry said that to. No. What's he doing in that I, in that situation? moment? If the Harry is, is Harry in a headlock? No. Harry's running. He's, because if Parker's in a headlock, he's tied up. He's tied up. He's not tied up though. Is there this whole scene? We're learning Harry is is literally breaking his bonds. Okay, but is he gonna get away from Marcone and Hendricks in that room, or Flatnose in the next room? Like, well, that is why he's waiting for the reaction. Sure, I get that. I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I just, believe he, I believe he's actually he would sign that for Murphy. Is what my he, thought was. No, I think if it came down to it, if he had no other way out, he would sign it for Murphy. But I don't think that it, he what he's doing by saying he will sign it, he's it, it it's the he's lighting the fuse. It's an incendiary fair. process. He's lighting the fuse by saying that he is lighting the fuse, which is going to explode Parker, which is going to attract Hendrix and distract uh, Marcone. And in that moment, because throughout this whole paragraph, his whole, sorry, this whole chapter, he's talking about escaping, about running. But he needs to distract them enough so that he can run. This is all a TNT, Acme, light the, light the fuse, so it, blah, 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 bang, distract somebody, bang, distract somebody so he can run. And that is what happens in the story. Oh, fair enough. I, I Like I said, I just... But that's I totally it, how I saw it, and I was super excited by it. Oh no! And I, I'm, <laughs> I agree that he's definitely using it. Yeah. As a, as and again, that one phrase where he says anything to get away from these animals. Yeah. Is very clearly continuing his plan from part from chap one of the last chapters. I just felt like that. This is a different decision that he's making in his office because Murphy is involved. That yeah, was just no, a hundred percent. She is, she is a a flag in that whole situation, but I think he's aware of the other elements. That's fair enough. So, um, he uh, Parker lets out a scream, and he, you know, whatever. Uh, he Hendricks dodged obviously, you know, faster than he should be able to. Um, and Parker said, "The wizard's mine," and he threw himself at Marcone. And this doesn't make any sense. Marcone moved like a snake in his zillion dollar business suit. And made a curved knife appear in his hands. He swept it in an arc that was followed by a spray of blood from Parker's wrist. Oh, you think he just house. kind of materializes a knife out of the fucking nowhere? Like he, Weird. I don't know, is it human? Weird, so I'm saying. <laughs> if I'm right about that, if I'm right about that, like, come on. <laughs> Harry's finally free. His legs are shaky and he's running to the door. Um... As soon as he gets there, because nothing can work out reasonably, Agent Denton is standing there. Motherfucker. They're all looking confused, and he says, the wizard mustn't escape. Who says mustn't? 
Who says mustn't? I don't know. I say shan't. I, I have said shan't. So, I mean, mustn't, you shan't. Would. I know. All right, you would. Uh, he said in his voice, calm and precise, kill him. And Ben's eyes gleamed. It's a fucking creep show. She's a total she, creeper. She hissed something under her breath while reaching her hand into her jacket. Wilson did the same. I brought my Ford movement to a sudden halt fell and started scrambling back into the building. Uh, instead of drawing guns, though, they changed. They are now, uh, apparently they're ex and wolves. Mother they're, bears. And I like that their, their coloring as wolves matches their hair color, which I just, I just think it's kind of interesting. And it makes sense, and it's certainly reasonably lore-wise. It's just, yeah, kind of cool. Um, but uh, they were huge. Six feet long, not including the tail, and as high as my belly at their shoulders. And Harry's like six foot a bunch. Yeah. Uh, their entirely human eyes shone as did their bared fangs. That is fucking creepy as fuck. Wolf shaped yeah. wolves with human eyes. Crazy. Creepastic. Uh, it's like the end of uh, Hunger Games. <laughs> There's a reference I haven't made yet, huh? Yeah, that, I don't know. That is not a drink tastic one. That's not something everyone needs to drink on. It is now with the other your like, favorite drinking game fans. I uh you want to talk about some schlocky <laughs> writing from the late aughts. I was there. I was on it. Um I flung myself back to the door and slammed clothes. The wolves are hit the door. It's basically just now there's the lycanthropes are showing up as the fucking uh motorcycles without with flat tires finally get there. Parker and Hendrix and Marcone are are doing the dance in the room. Uh but you have the Hexen Wolves. It's just a fucking shit show at this garage now, and Harry has no power. He's exhausted. Everything hurts. And, um, yeah, he's in the middle of a fucking, like, war zone, which is great. Uh, he just stumbles through. He reaches the corner, and he just kind of sits in the corner and grabs a wrench. So yeah. he's just this, like, lanky-ass six-foot-ten dude sitting in a corner with a wrench, like, held in his hands, rocking back and forth, mm -hmm. holding on the giant gigantic scary wolves find him um, <laughs> well he was like I was alone I'd hurt myself using too much of my magic while on the go-go portion and potion and didn't have anything left to throw now except for the wrench in my hands on, <laughs> on arms uh, I love it yeah uh, all around him animals fought for control of the jungle it's only a matter of time before one of them stumbled across a weakened and exhausted wizard named Harry Dresden <laughs> talk about frying pans and fires so spectacular. Such a fantastic line to end the chapter. It's summer day, I love A hundred percent. All right. So chapter... We got... We got... Re we really... Yeah. Uh, okay. So in chapter 24, my biggest thing was, I was fucking right about the FBI assholes. They're werewolves. I believe that was my crackpot theory two weeks ago. Just saying. It uh, wasn't they. You said Denton. I did say Denton. And by the way, who turns into a fucking werewolf in this chapter? Fucking Denton. I was right. I, I, about excuse me. Legit. He did that in my chapter. Okay, he whatever. Turns he turns Credit into where credit's due. He turns into one, though. I was <laughs> fucking right. Anyway. I love that. I love that. That was your... I love it. Did you notice? <laughs> did you notice my poker face, by the way? You I didn't, didn't say nothing. anything. You didn't give it away. Cacao. Okay. So this is my big, this is a big one for me. So I'm going to, I'm going to read a little bit because it has so much in, so much import, important, like to the, to Harry's world. Okay. Um, so it, this is the beginning of the chapter. It could, couldn't possibly get any worse than this. I thought I cowered in the corner, clutching my captured wrench, like a child's teddy bear with no way out and full knowledge that my magic had failed me. Oddly, that thought troubled me more than probable death. A lot more. Death was something that happened to everyone. Only the timing is different for each of us. I knew that I would eventually die. Hell, I knew that I might die horribly. But I had never thought that the magic would fail me. More importantly, oh, sorry, more accurately, I had never guessed that I might fail it. Holy fucking shit. Harry said, 
a few chapters ago that he knew as a wizard that it could actually get worse. He would never say it can't get worse than this because he knew it could. But he just said it couldn't possibly get any worse than this. Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. I, I, we know, I literally, in my notes, in, in, ca- in all caps and in, in bold, it says, we know this is bad, bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, bad, bad. Like, double bad. Uh, he feels like he lost it all. D- double plus ungood. Uh, yes. You know, anyone that gets that reference gets a gold star. But he, this is, this is also, we learn a little bit about where his, his brain is. He said, um, that he felt that he had burned out some internal circuitry that I might not, that might not ever come back. It was a loss of identity. I was a wizard. It was more than just a job, more than just a title. Wizardry was at the core of my being. It was my relationship with my magic, the way I used it, the things I let me do, sorry, the things it let me do that defined me, shaped me, gave me purpose. I dwelled on these things while death danced over the concrete floor, clutching them like a sailor clinging to the wreckage of his ship, trying to ignore the storm that blasted it to pieces. I mean, Harry's in some dire shit. I like the juxt- Again, so we'll notice we've used juxtaposition about 714 right. times. That's our helpful. Oh, uh, no, it is literally, 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 hundred percent accurate, though. No, no, no. Oh, it's all of those things. I mean, it is, but it is my favorite word. Mm-hmm. Um, which I love the word juxtaposition. Mine is onomatopoeia. Bid. Bounce. Bounce. Um. Ah. I, I like onomatopoeias because I understand them. <laughs> um. My my tiny little my tiny little brain understands those. Oh. Um. But I um. I like the juxtaposition of his description here and Harry's description in the car back in chapter two. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Murphy's description of her as a policewoman um, back in chapter two. And I, I described it as very unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I made a, a joke about it. I want to say last week, when it all bleeds together when you don't sleep and all you do is edit podcasts and then... <laughs> And then things just get blow up in your face, yeah. And yeah, um, but and <laughs> basically, drinking, gambling, and editing podcasts has been my last week of the last five days of my life. Uh, um, but the I made a joke about that about me as a coach too. Um, and I, I mean, I wasn't joking really. I mean, that is really like that is my identity. I, I identify that you know it's not my it's not the job that pays the bills. That's podcasting. I'm not just kidding. Just very, very just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I work, well, I help run a small business. Um, but I, so I got a day job, and that's what I do on my my sidekick. But that is like what I've done since I was 16 years old. I was I water polo coach. That's that's my it was it's been my profession for a long time. Um, and I identify as that. And Murphy identifies as a cop, and Harry identifies as a wizard, which is a little bit different because it's more. You know, I too I identify as a wizard. Exactly, but like. It, it, we have a lot of people here who have like a kind of an unhealthy relationship with their power. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I mean that small P obviously in this case with Murphy and myself, but it's something you do and that you're good at and you let it kind of control you. And then when, when you have an issue with that, you know, when that part of your life isn't working, it basically shuts everything down. And I've, you know, I've been in that situation with, you know, when, Whatever, but like it, like I said, when when Murphy was talking about, it, it's very unhealthy, but it's not inaccurate. And so Harry, right now, like his entire being is based around his ability to do spells and help people. And when Murphy can't do those things because she's under pressure from IA, and when you know I couldn't do those things because parents of high school kids are annoying, and when you know Harry can't do these things now because he's you know overextend himself, like. You, you don't know who you are as a person. You don't have you anymore. And that's what Harry's going through in this moment where it's like, it literally can't get worse than that. You know, he was joking the, you know, a couple chapters ago, like Alyssa said, like, like, if you always know it can get worse, it's always going to get, there's all, you know, there's always, you know, another puddle you can jump, you can fall into. 
But right. so everything can always be resolved. But he's, all of those things can get resolved. This yeah. is him. He doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Like, what What do I do now that I'm not me? Even if I survive this, what does tomorrow look like? I have more on that later. Okay. So, you know, we find out this is the bad, bad. Um, and then... Because, you know, Harry's entire identity is being a wizard. Uh, so, and the, the one thing I noted... So, then Marcone and Hendrix make a break for it. They get out. An interesting detail. Marcone is the one driving the truck. In my mind, that's some dire shit. Because yeah, we know Marcone doesn't drive. He's always being driven. So he is taking the initiative in this action, which is probably something he's not familiar with. Because Marcone made a break for one of the garage doors, only to be pinned down by a rusted truck by behind a rusted truck by gunfire from some of the street wolves. Hendrix joined him, and a moment later, the truck roared to life and crashed out through the garage door and into the gravel parking lot. Hendrix, in the rear of the truck, fired several blasts from the big shotgun. That means Marcone is driving. That's pretty significant to me. So the street, ro- street walls and FBA agents fight. Harry gets back to a, a wall, is trying to escape. And he, somebody's scratching under the wall. He smacks it with a, uh, his wrench. And, we, and he hears, wizard, stop that. It's Tara. I blinked, startled, and leaned down close to the hole. Tara, is that you? How did you know it was me? You are the only man I've ever met, Tara growled, who would smash the paws that are trying to free you from certain death. I flinched at another burst of gunfire from the far side of the garage. I'm going to tell them to dig again. Do not strike their paws. Them? I demanded. Them who? But she didn't answer me. Instead, the scrabbling sounds began again. So she's got some of her little wolves digging in, and he's trying to beat him with a, a uh, wrench. I mean, it's just the, that moment is so spectacular. But in her, 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 her Cub Scouts. So what I wrote in my notes is maybe she is a good guy. Because we've been back and forth as to whether Tara is a good guy, whether Tara this is just in this to better herself, her own situation. Maybe she is actually a good guy. This is the first moment that I thought maybe she is. All right. So, well, what, I mean, yeah, I'll tell you, in this moment, I, what have we seen from Tara to think she isn't a good guy? I know, I've, I mean, I've read it, but I'm, I'm thinking, like, when my first read-through of this book, it always confused me, this, like, Tara's never presented as a bad guy. I no, she's not why. presented as a bad guy, but she also has no soul. Yeah, that is certainly interesting. That's, that's the thing. She has. I, I think that's the biggest thing is that she has no soul, and that we don't know what side she's on, who she's battling for. I think my issue is just a uh, more of a Buffy thing. Drink. <laughs> <laughs> no soul, no problem. You know, you do your job. But no, but that, that is a good point. Um, anyway, so we're moving along. And um, one of the things is, so the, the Ben and Denton are snarling at each other. And, and uh, Ben says, the wizard knows too much. Which is fantastic. Because the wizard does know too much. Uh, and then, you know, the Ben is, conf- is trying to convince Denton into changing. And it's this very erotic kind of moment where she's, he's licking blood off his hands and, and they, they end up both turning into wolves and they both attack Parker. And Harry stares at, he says, I stared in this sort of sick, sickened fascination. The wolves buried him under a mound of fangs and fur and blood and absolute fury. He screamed the knife flailing, and then it was cast aside out of his hands to land spinning on the floor not far from me. 
So this vicious attack is happening, and then this knife is just spinning on the floor in front of Harry. Again, cinematic as fuck. So cinematic. It's and and that's the thing where it's it's this is what we're seeing. Uh, and then Harry gets out. And the description again, this is a brilliant I literally wrote in my notes, brilliant description. I jerked my way out into the open air to find myself in an alley behind the garage, dimly lit by a distant street life. There were wolves everywhere. Three wolves, smaller than the ones I had seen before, were spread in a loose ring about a great russet furred beast with bat like ears. The great wolf's coat was spattered with blood, and two of the smaller wolves lay nearby, yelping in pain, steering weakly, blood matting their coats. Just a horrible time and place. And Tara says, You took your time, wizard. And he says, We've got to get out of here. Denton and the others will be coming. And she's saying, no, 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 we're going to handle this. And Harry says, you can't stop them all, I said. There's three more like this one. And he has to convince her to leave these, the enemy, and bring their wounded. He says, too many people had been hurt. Too much. Suffering caused by creatures of magic and the night. Things that I should have been handling. We're learning about Harry's guilt. Harry might be a Catholic or Jewish, we don't know, but the guilt is there. He feels so much responsibility. It doesn't it didn't matter to me at that moment that I couldn't work any of my spells against them. I might not have any magic available to me, but that didn't make me any less of a, wiz a wizard, one of the magi, the wise. That's the true power of a wizard. I know things. Knowledge is power. With power comes responsibility. How many times have we talked about power and responsibility? And here he says it directly. That made the entire thing pretty simple. I clenched the wrench, the wrench in my hand, took a deep breath, and threw myself forward at the great wolf's back. The wolf, the huge wolf sensed me coming, spun with abrupt speed, and met me in the air. It slammed me down to the concrete and bent its jaws toward my throat. I heard Tara cry out, and she and the other wolves moved forward, but they would never have been able to get to the thing before it killed me. That wasn't the point. I jammed the wrench into the wolf's jaw, feeling some teeth tear at one of my fingers as I did. The wolf snarled and jerked the wrench out of my hands. It spun end over end away from me, and the great beast turned back toward me, its eyes glowing. I had time to watch it, all in great detail. The wolf's power, its speed, simply shocked me. It was huge, quick, and I didn't have a prayer against it. The distant streetlight gleamed off of its reddened fangs as muzzles sped toward me, toward my throat. And that's how this chapter ends. Holy fucking shit. They, that is probably one of the most vivid moments in the entire series so far oh it's just so great it's so spectacular absolutely brilliant there's a uh the power of responsibility conversation is is you know, obviously it's thematic and it comes yes. to any any superhero or you know any power that has great power yeah i don't know the billionaires of our country uh. <laughs> I knew you liked that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're, the, our next podcast is going to be on for, there's number two. Podcast number two is on Lissy's um, which one act play. Um, <laughs> podcast number three is going to be on late stage capitalism. <laughs> podcast number four is going to be um, leading the revolution. All right, um, let's go. <laughs> I, it, what it, you're it will saying is, damn the man, save the empire. <laughs> damn the man, save the empire. Um, I do love uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, the, the with no no way home. Mm -hmm. Aunt when Aunt May spoiler alert is doing spoiler alert things, and she <laughs> the, with great power there must also come great responsibility. Is the actual. Spider-Man phrasing that got bastardized to with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um but uh I I have no other 
thought besides that. I just like the, that actual, I like the full quote better than yep. the shortened one. Yes. Um, Cause it's not, it ought, it doesn't automatically happen, but it must happen. You know what I mean? Like it's like, yes. you must make this happen. And that, yes. that is what Harry's doing right now. Harry isn't doing with great power comes great responsibility. He has no power right now. Yeah. He, he's just a fucking dude. Yeah. He has had that power. There must be this responsibility. And so he's got a great responsibility and so he's like, fuck it. Let's go, Wolf. Yeah. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? Oh my God, totally. Um, That's totally this moment. Let's fucking get it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so Harry's Harry's wrestling with this fucking Hexen Wolf. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just a quote I like. One is, its eyes are blue rather than any proper lupine shade. Mm-hmm. Which reminds me of lupine theriomorphs, which is my favorite line from the novel. Um. He doesn't need. He said he, he noticed all these things with his eyes because he didn't need his eyes. He was looking at shit while just trying to wrestle with the guy and figure out, um, you know, where the uh, belt was. He so he ends up working the uh, wolf pelt belt off of him, and he gets it off. Um, and uh, as as Roger Harris, the ginger FBI forensics douchebag, is turning back into a uh, <laughs> dude, he says. Hexen Wolf jerk off. I love that so much. Blast him in the nuts, which I love. <laughs> As he should, by the fucking way. Yeah, no problem. Um, and uh, this part's weird. I don't love it. Um, because he says everyone back off, and Terry says he's ours. He hurt those of our pack. It's like, well, then go get them some fucking help. And she's like, his blood is ours. And the wolves, who are Human children, uh, not children, human young adults. They're not young Please. adults. Was a newer, newer, how do you describe 20 somethings? Maybe they're young grad- adults. They're young adults. You know, young adults are like late teens, I feel like. No, you're 20. not an adult until you're 18. So. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like calling a 22 two year old a young adult is like super fucking condescending. Not really, because I've been called, I was called a young adult up until I was 30. I still am called young lady on that's three. That's three. Cause you, that's because you look like you're 16. <laughs> <laughs> that you're, not a good, you're not a good control group. <laughs> that might be. <laughs> uh, but these are human beings who aren't, you know, as Bob said, they're not very good at being wolves yet. And they want to eat him because it's, it's just weird. I don't, I don't love it. It doesn't really fit any of the lore we've gotten so far it's mo it fits tara for fucking sure and i guess if tara's encouraging that i get them kind of like all right let's fucking go let's fucking go whoa, 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 whoa. Hoo, hoo. big dog gotta eat hoo. um but yeah um and he said he can't hurt him now killing him won't make your friends better get them fucking home bro like let's take care of them let's not kill anybody so, more yeah she said, you do not understand wizard it is our way is it Shut the fuck up. I understand. You're not going to make me angry. We're not doing this. Mm-hmm. We're not doing this. Um, he, you know, he threatens Tara, but uh, which I like. Like, we're, again, he has no power, but that responsibility is there. He doesn't currently have power. But he has responsibility. Um, he basically, like, you know, Let's fucking go. Anybody want anybody want to do this? No, no, no. Then all the you know kids, you know. Um, and then uh Tara says, Have them come back to your cells, and they all transform back into a bunch of um That's you know. huge though. Everyone come back to yourselves. They're right, able like that. I actually wrote that down. That everyone come back to yourselves is such a huge moment. But she also intimidates Tara so much that she respects his power. Oh yeah, and then but his just, power without his power without power. It's he is a, at this power. point he has no power. Yeah, it's it's amazing. This is yeah, a, I love it. Oh god, this was a good one. But when, I literally wrote down, "Everyone, come back to yourselves." So the wolves are not they're 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 the wolves are not themselves. They're an element of their personality. Sorry, that was my that was my like. Ooh. No, that's oh. interesting. I actually want to put. Could you could you put a pin in that? Like, make a note on that line for next week i will try i have it written down but i know right that's what i'm saying right we'll write it down again um i'm like i don't have a highlighter i'm usually the highlighter person 
Okay. No, but you know, but that's that's something that I'm actually I really like your thought on that, and mm -hmm. I, I don't disagree. But I actually I want to I want to talk about that. With I really to like that line so much. Well, I, that line's great, and I want to talk about how that reflects on Tara. Okay. Um, she took charge of the situation basically, um, and he starts to he starts to interrogate Harris. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and Harris does the you know they're like you kill me or bullshit, and then they they give him you know. He ends up getting a little information. This is an exposition dump, which is fine. A little bit, but it didn't feel so dumpy. Well, again, I mean, you know, we talked about this, you know, when it was last week, last last mm -hmm. book, two weeks ago, but about how, like, there's only so many ways to get information, right? So, like, interrogating one of the bad guys that he captures is a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it just is kind of cliched, and especially when he says, like, I'm not saying anything else. Like, well, why not? Why, why did you say that? But not, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like... It's such a stupid, like, arbitrary line. Like, I'll tell you all this stuff that you kind of already knew just to confirm it. But I won't tell you anything else. I mean, I does have a gun over his head and there's chin, so. Well, sure, but he, but again, at the end, he says, his, he's not saying anything else. Yeah. But he basically, he basically breaks the story, you know, you know, tells her what it is about. They wanted to take Marcone down and they knew they couldn't do it through the legal system. Mm -hmm. So somehow Denton got the wolf belts. And... See. They were a little bit too much, so he took them away after the first couple of nights, and then they continued to use them. They basically they're very addictive. When when you're changed, you, you, there's just your body sings with it. I tried. I literally to... wrote wolf equals drugs. So yes, well, I mean he makes that reference very clear. But they talk like they're tweakers. Oh sure, but I mean he makes a direct reference. He says I tried coke once in college, mm -hmm. and it was nothing compared to this. The blood, and his tongue flicked out over his blood stained lips. Fucking creep show. It's super creepy. But it's so well written. Oh, yeah. I mean, just, but, and, you know, Harris saying, you know, once you do it, you can't stop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they just. Murdered. It's very tweaky, though. It's very methy. I mean, it's, it's any, any drug, any, any power. It's, you, you're destroying, you know, you're, you, once you kill, you get the taste of human flesh. You want to keep killing and keep killing and keep killing. Scary. Um, and Denton had to take the belts away from them. That's how they laid, laid low. And then they showed back up at the varsity before the full moon, um, and that's you know, and that's kind of the whole deal is that the they said you know I said it last week like the whole Northwest Passage just a MacGuffin. The idea was we yeah. wanted to get Mick Finn, this Loop Guru, and Marcone in the same place so that we could have this story tell itself. It's fine. I mean, MacGuffins are real and fine, and that's that's how you. It's an important part of storytelling. I mean, it's. Sometimes they're better than others. I mean, literally in the biggest movie of all time, they call it an obtainium. <laughs> it's, it's right. Like, so yeah, it doesn't need to be anything glorious um, or spectacular, but it's just, you know, and I don't even know if that's actually a, a great, a di you know, directly, it could accurately be defined as a MacGuffin because they're not trying to kind of get that. They're not really trying to get that, but it's just a, I guess a plot device. I'll fuck edit. It's just a plot device. Um, it's not an MacGuffin. That's fair. I'm gonna edit that. I don't want to feel stupid. I mean, I, I feel stupid. I don't want to sound stupid. I feel <laughs> stupid all the time. And you know, then and, you know, and he continues to, to question about like, why'd you send me to the Street Wolves? And this is the part that bothers the fuck out of me. Okay. Why do you Why do you think he sent you to the Street Wolves? Because he wanted you to kill them. He wanted yeah, kill. Well, he wanted you dead. Yeah, he wanted them to kill you. So, how he didn't click right then? That the FBI are the bad guys is the biggest plot hole in the history of plot holes. Because I'm more observant than he is. <laughs> the sure. moment I met Benton, I knew he was a werewolf. That's fair. I just like, like, why would they send you there? And then they all, all immediately, like, first you have this awful run in with them the night before. And the next day, like, the next day, Denton's like a little bit nice, and now we're buddies again. Hope. It's all about hope. You hope yes. that they're I mean, better than that. You hope think, that they're better. I think than it's, that. it's a word that rhymes with that. Like, it's just like it's just such bullshit. Yeah. And no, it is. It, but it is. But I can kind of see it. it's it's that hope. It's the maybe, maybe not. Who are we to judge? Who are we not to? That's the thing. It's that differentiation. Because Harry's like, who are we to judge? And Harris is like, who are we not to judge? The power's in our hands. So it's. I think it's that dichotomy where it's like, Harry has, we're not, we're not the judge, jury, and executioner. 
why would you send me there? I have hope that you would actually have ethics and morals. When, you know, Harris is like, who are we not to? The power is on our hands. We have the responsibility to do it for good, to do our jobs. But Harry's like, no, 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 that's not your job. Your job isn't to kill people and blame other people. I think that Harry is just, it's not necessarily, he mentions it when talking about uh, Br Brian or one of the other where he says something about, it's not about ignorance, it's about innocence. And I think this might be one of those moments where he's not ignorant, but he's, it's innocence that he hopes that they would not, they're the FBI. You know, like, you're not going to be the bad guys. You can't be the bad guys. But that's such a foreign thought to me. I know. <laughs> But that, but, you know, it's that innocence. Again, not ignorance, but innocence. He uses that when he talks later in the, the, the next chapter, I believe, when he's talking about Brian or Byron or whatever the fuck his name is. But it's not ignorance, it's innocence. Who? What's his name? Hold on. Billy. Billy. Billy? Not, I got, you know, I'm close. Uh, uh, that, that, was, that was my kind of, my take from it, where he's not... That's, that's totally fair. I, I just... I guess, you know, like, you don't ever want to expect the worst of people. I think yeah. it's more for me, it was just like, there's literally nothing, no interactions except for him hanging out with Bob in the in the basement <laughs> between Ben tries to fucking murder Murphy and Denton says, oh, hey, shucks, hey, buddy. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, that, like, that's, those are back-to-back -back interruption, inter, 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 uh, interactions with the FBI people mm -hmm. and then they immediately send him off to somebody who wants to kill like how do you not put this together and that yeah I'll talk to this kind of at the end of next week it's just there's that's one of the parts of it that's just like the story doesn't the name and I, I touched on this this last recap but like there's a lot of really good stuff in here just the overall narrative doesn't flow it doesn't click it doesn't make sense i mean it's just, i think it's i mean you and i have a little bit more of a cynical perspective on the world because we're more realistic i'm but, actually very positive in most interactions this is dealing with law enforcement though oh with law no, no. that's not cynical that's realistic you know i know i know i know i know but that's the thing that's how i kind of i think it honestly it literally boils down to hope no, I agree. I you hope fair. that these are the good guys. You hope that these are the good guys. Yeah, it probably is, is actually colored by that conversation where he let Murphy down. Yeah. And now he wants to, like, you know, do any can to make it up to her and, you know, anything to make good with these FBI. Yeah, I, I, that's that's fair. Yeah. And that's um, that's where we go. That's where we go with that. Uh, and then we have to get out of here. We got to get out of there. And he says, you know, he gets serious. Um, and then after, you know, he says, like, he's going to get my belt back. He's like, fuck off, bro. Right. And, um, and then Tara says, uh, you were wrong, wizard. And he's like, how so? They have not become animals. And when he was talking to. Oh, I like uh, this part. He was talking to the, the kid. He said, it turns you into an animal and you become the animal. And she said, no. They haven't been become animals. Animals do not do what they have done. Animals kill to eat, to defend themselves or their own, and to protect their territory. Not for the joy of it. Not for the lust of it. Only humans do that, wizard. And he said, I guess you're right. <laughs> and she's basically saying, you know, he, he tells her that the, the story is like, that we're basically, he told the kid that we're going to go to Marcones at Moonrise. The loop guru is bind bound to me. This is this is what's happening, mm -hmm. and they're heading over there. And she says, "Well, the, all these people, like the FBI, is going to stop you." And and when they do, he said, "Well, I can't let them go on. If they have, they're out of control, and I don't think I can. They can stop themselves from killing. And when they do, I guess I'm going to need to get very human." I highlighted that in red. Oh, it's so fucking good. Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. All right. Chapter 26. Um, Literally, the, my note on this is this chapter is 
This is a simple chapter, but it has so much in it. Okay. So uh, they, Van pulls up and it's fucking Susan. Of course it is. Of course it is. Um, and this is my kind of awkward moment where it's, I, I'll talk about it in Yikes later. Um, but Susan says, your face looks like a p- sack of purple potatoes. And he says, you say the sweetest things. <laughs> that was just fantastic. And they end up heading back. And uh, he's like, he asks Susan what she's doing there. She's like, driving. I was the only one old enough to rent the van. <laughs> Love that. That's sort of painful for reals. Oh, my goodness. It made me giggle. I'm not going to lie. And so, you know, he falls asleep. And the only then he wakes up when they're in the drive through And he puts on a crown and says he is the Burger King. I am the Burger King. Yes. He intoned with an imperious narrowing of his eyes. Yeah, absolutely ridiculous. And uh, all the young wolves, all the young wolves are there hungrily wolfing, no pun intended, down the food. And Tara says puppies. As though the word should explain. <laughs> I just love that. I think that's fantastic description of that, that group. Um, and it's, we learn a little bit about why her blood was at the restaurant where we're at the restaurant where Spike died or the restaurant in progress. I knew that the pack that had harassed my fiance was about. I decided where they might strike and went there in an attempt to stop them. All by yourself? Tara sniffed. Most of those who turn themselves into wolves know little about being wolf, wizard. But these had taken too much of the beast inside. I ran through the window glass and fought, but they outnumbered me. I left before I could be killed. So she was there to try to help um, they, uh, tried to help her fiance. Like she tried to help. Uh, obviously, she did not succeed. So, Taryn. Uh, so she talks about. They talk about you know going to, uh, the safe place to arm and prepare ourselves. And he says, "Myself to prepare myself. I'm not. <laughs> ta- I'm not taking you with me." You are incorrect, Tara said. I am going with you. No. She fastened her amber eyes on mine. You are strong, wizard, but you have not yet seen my beast. The men you will oppose will take my fiancé from me. I will not allow that. I will be with you, or you will kill me to stop me. She's not... This is a fuck around and find out moment, and she is not fucking around. Uh, and this is kind of a entertaining thing, because it's, it's, again, he's not talking about her in a sexual manner but he says put some clothes on you weird yellow-eyed table dancing werewolf training cryptic stare me right in the eyes and don't even blink wench <laughs> but i don't know why that made me laugh so much it was such like a okay i i bitch um anyway they end up at um george's parents house and uh he's like where are we and she's in georgia says it's my parents place they're in italy for another week i rubbed a hand over my face They aren't going to mind you having a party, are they? She flashed me an annoyed look and said, not as long as we clean up the blood. This is a very different party than I would have had when I was 19 or 20. Just saying. Um, And then, so they all get inside and Harry pulls, or Harry and Billy are hanging outside. Billy pulls them aside and uh, is trying to figure out if the Alphas can come along. Uh, But it's sort of funny, this sort of interaction. Billy is sharper than we give him credit for. Do all wizards, he said, get the kitty crowns and wear them around? Or is that only for special occasions? Do our all werewolves, I shot back, snatching the crown from my head, wear glasses and too much old spice? Or is that only for full moon? He's just being a snarky bitch. And then, you know, Billy's like, we want to come help. We want to help. And this is great little sentiment. Oh, good grief. The Mickey Mouse Club of werewolves wanted to throw in on my side. Werewolf Kateer roll call. Billy, Georgia, Tommy, Cindy. Sheesh. No way. Absolutely not. Why not, he said. Look, kid, you don't know what these Hexenwolfen could be like. You don't know what Marcone can be like. And you sure as hell have never seen anything like MacFin outside of a movie theater. And even if you had the skills to deal with it, What makes you think you have a right to go along? The same thing that makes you think you do, Mr. Dresden. Oh, dang it. I love love that line. That's fantastic. 
And, you know, Bailey's like, I don't know a lot compared to you, but I'm not stupid. I've got eyes. I see some things that everyone else pretends aren't there. This is a great kind of moment because it's their supernatural shit is everywhere. He's like, you know, there this vampire craze sweeping the nation. Why the hell shouldn't there be some genuine vampires in it? Did you know that violent crimes have increased nearly 40% in the last three years, Mr. Dresden? Murder alone has almost doubled. I blinked at the kid. I hadn't really read the numbers. I knew that Murphy and some of the other cops had said that the streets were getting worse, and I knew myself on some deep level that the world was getting darker. Hell, it was one of the reasons I did idiotic things like I was doing tonight. My own effort to lift up a torch. And I hear stories. Read the tabloids sometimes. So what if the supernatural world is making a comeback? What if that accounts for some of what is going on? Holy fucking shit, Billy's got some eyes out on the world. And his whole thing is someone has to do something, and he thinks he can. So, they're gonna try and do it. And this, uh, more little quips, I don't think you're ready for the big leagues yet, Billy. Could be, he said, but there's no one else in the bullpen. Pretty smart. Uh, and it just oozed out of him in a way that only inexperienced and idealistic can manage. It was comforting, and at the same time, it was the most frightening thing about him. <laughs> his ignorance no not ignorance really innocence he didn't know what he would be going out to face if i let him go along i'd be dragging him down with me but that ignorant that innocence is what i was discussing i was talking about with with harry with the hopes with the fbi and i think that he sees it in billy because there might be some of that in him not as deeply rooted but i think it's there and then we learn you know Harry's Harry feels guilt. Harry feels guilt. And that's the problem. I think that's why he's worried about bringing him down with him. And, you know, it's that sort of thing that we're worried about. Um, and then Harry, this is another thing that uh, Harry's talking about God. And this is a good little bit. Of, it, it hits so deeply because it, 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 I mean, it affects me, but it's also very hairy. And it kind of gives me a little like, Harry and I have got something in common. I had never much believed in God. Well, that's not quite true. I believed that ver there was a God or something close enough to it to warrant the name. If there were demons, then there had to be angels, right? If there was a devil somewhere, there had to be a God. But he and I had never really seen things in quite the same terms. All the same, I flashed a look up at the ceiling. I, I didn't say or think any words. But if God was listening, I hoped he got the message nonetheless. I didn't want any of these children getting themselves killed. God damn, that was good. That's a great way. That, but that is very much Harry, you know. And that's, that's how the, the, that, the ending of that moment. That, that, that chapter is just really strong. Yeah, no, I dig it. I, I just like, also, it's like a calm before the storm kind of thing. True. Very, very true. It, there's a lot of really good stuff and some good character moments. Mm -hmm. We learn about these uh, alpha kids. Mm -hmm. I, I I very much dig all of the, uh, like, the, this movie, again, the movie, this this novel, its strength isn't the story. It's not the narrative. It's yeah. Right? These character moments where... They find out who they are to themselves, who they are to each other. And that's why, you know, you want to read a ser a book series, right? That's, that's why you don't yeah. want to read a book. You want to see these moments. And that's one thing where, why I feel like this series is so powerful is that even in their weakest moments, as far as, you know, the plot, there's just so much good shit going on. It's yeah, a hundred percent. I agree. I dig it very, very much. Yeah, I think it's great. So our last chapter of the night is chapter twenty-seven. And again, it, it's definitely not an action scene. Well, it's how you define it, I guess. And there's some there's some action. If you know what I mean. <laughs> um, but um, he uh, he ends up he he finds Susan because of her perfume. He smells her perfume, and he. he, he that's basically how he tracks her down. But when did we? When did that happen again? Happened before. 
beginning a storefront oh, in the bar. The very the very first time they sure. have each other. Yeah, in the book. Yeah. yeah, I just like that. Oh no, that's great. I love that. Again, these are those are the things that I don't. It's I ever... notice stupid details, so with that, it seems like that's it not... seems like an important detail to me. It's it's not stupid. It's it's, it's I, I I don't know how important it is necessarily, but it's definitely intentional. Oh yeah, you know um, it's the the harsh lines of. I like it. it. It's very much, it's that senses, the senses, their senses appeal to each other. Revulsion and hatred etched in the harsh lines of your face kind of line, the, uh, from the author who will never be named on this podcast. Um, unless we've named her before, but she's garbage and I hope we haven't. But, you know, the little things, those little callbacks are, I don't know if I'm, important probably isn't the right word, but they certainly lady on this in this case obviously the one i reference is massively important in that saga uh, i think that counts as a drink eh, we can drink on that <laughs> um yeah like the you know like the tiger kate you know the or the the tiger moment you reference with marcone there are a lot of those that are clearly intentional and and if they're not it's one hell of a coincidence well yeah so he um finds her in the bedroom one of the bedrooms in George's parents house <laughs> mm -hmm. our gazes met and held we'd looked on each other on one another a year before she fainted when she saw what was inside of him he and this is interesting he says I don't know what she saw I don't look too hard into mirrors and again we, we talked about that during Stormfront but I know you don't look too hard into mirrors but do you talk with your friends <laughs> do you have word conversations with other human beings like i guess i mean realistically for that conversation not to come up she must worry about what's in her soul as much as him right like why i i know what i would do immediately after having a soul gaze with somebody would be like oh my god here's what i saw tell me what you saw like i right like you're absolutely not not having a conversation about that right oh i mean clearly harry's I not yeah. a shining example of how to have well communicative relationships but i mean that's totally something you i think that would is something you would have a conversation it is definitely like it for real certainly interesting um he'd seen a passion like he'd rarely known in people other than himself the motivation to go to do to act was what drove her forward mm -hmm. digging up stories of the supernatural for a half comic rag like <laughs> she had a gift for it for digging down into the muck that people tried to ignore and coming up with facts that weren't always easily explained. He made people think. It was something personal for her. And I knew that much. But not why. Susan was determined to make people see the truth. Again, that's a description of her soul that I don't recall. Oops, say that a lot. People are literally going to think I've never read these novels. Um, I, I, Susan, I really like Susan. And she is, that's a relatively good description of her. There's clearly, that's Harry's version of where she was at when they soul gaze, right? Because that's humans change, right? He talked about that with Bames. Your soul would naturally be the same, right? So a, a soul gaze with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, with me when I was 30, Versus me when I'm 38. Mm -hmm. Timing is everything. Um, you you get very different imagery. Um, and that's, I think that's the same thing with her. But and that's not to say that it's okay. wrong or incorrect. But it's you you grow and adapt and change. And we I, I not we in this case we is in me the mouse in my pocket and <laughs> dozens of listeners worldwide uh hundreds at this. Point. Where we end up, you know, where we see her later in the series, this isn't necessarily yeah. inaccurate, but it's definitely, I'm not spoiling, I'm trying really hard not to, but it's just, it is who she is. She's so much more than that, but this description means, very is, is exactly right, if that makes sense. I don't know. None of that, none of that matters. I just, <laughs> she's a really interesting, complex character that, I, I love that description of her. I, I, I mean, I've never sat and really, like, dug into she is a very interesting character. Her development has just been fantastic. The things she's seen, the things she's experienced. She's a ride or fucking die, though. 
Oh, she she's got to be a ride or die. She's the fucking truth. I love her. You're not a Susan fan. I'm trying to decide who I would cast as a like a famous actor in her role, and I'm like, I don't know, Danny DeVito. Oh my god! Well, Danny DeVito can be cast in any role. Thank oh, you very much. He's no Danny DeVito is every that character. Any and every. Um, could you could be Mar- like Marissa Tomei and uh, my cousin Ben. Yeah, she's just a badass. Age appropriate now, but but um, Oliver Stone could actually play her now, and I would. I would be okay. Yeah. So, he, but he ends up in the room, and she says, "They they'll kill you. Don't go." Uh, I've got to. Like, this is this is who I am, baby girl. Um, it's cool. You know how it is, rock and roll and whatnot. Um, is basically what he says. And she says, "We can go hide." And he says, "Nah, nah, nah." Um, this more happens than that, but basically that's the gist. Um, honestly, they're just. It's one of those scenes that doesn't... It's more about their characters and the words they're saying. They just love each other, so they don't want each other to come to harm. But realistically, neither of them's not going to be involved. A, she's the only one who could drive the fucking van. Um, but, you know, but they do have a, you know some good talk about, like... This is them kind of committing to each other. You know, they've been the Facebook status. It's complicated over the last two novels, and... It, you know, there's always been something, you know, and, you know, we, we, Lissy brought up a couple chapters or last chapter. Know, who fucking knows? It was probably six hours ago and seven glasses of wine, though. I'm you just know, glad she's still know. sitting I've up. I've only right. had three glasses of uh, wine, two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, like, she, she brought up the manipulation, quote unquote, so from, sad. yep, you know, when they ran out of Wolf Lake Park, which I, I me and Susan both don't think was really all that manipulative. Yeah. Um, only Harry and Lissy. She was making me live too. Um, but you know they they have this relationship. Yeah. And it kind of is blossoming okay. and growing, and they are clearly I mean, they're, they're falling in love basically. Mm-hmm. And, and it's one of those you know it's a moment where it's this they're certainly in a situation that's difficult and powerful, and it is pushing them towards that. But it, we've seen this build into mm-hmm. novel. You know, this isn't this isn't the love potion. This isn't the scary very true i mean this also isn't a scary situation acting as love potion like this is the natural progression of their relationship that they do love each other and they've never real well she says i don't know if i want to fall in love with you harry i don't know if i could stand it because there's also that level of fear which i get oh yeah no it's certainly love with a small l i mean it's a it's a lowercase l love you know they're not committing their lives to each other they're certainly not talking about forever but this is them kind of agreeing that this is what they want and and they've they've known that they just haven't said it and that Mm -hmm. is a continuing theme in their relationship that it's neither of them are super great at talking because Mm -hmm. a she's a reporter who mostly what she does is listen and wait for other people to say stuff and He's a fucking sociopath who doesn't talk to people. Um, they're both socially awkward. They they very much are. Um, no, I, like it's just it's clearly Harry is damaged, and she is willing to investigate. And you know that you know as a reporter mm-hmm. does, but um, neither of them is really good about like like this is a conversation they could have had. It's in six months since mm-hmm. Stormfront. And they've had this on, you know, this sort of relationship. They could have had this relationship any, at any t- this conversation at any time. So they're kind of backed mm-hmm. into a corner. And this is kind of a theme of their relationship where, like, they don't really know what they are until something big happens, you know? And that's, um, you know, certainly not unreasonable for some 20-something kids and for some 30-something people who had <laughs> similar <laughs> relationships. Um, you know, where you just, you don't, it's hard to define everything. And they struggle with it, but they, um, you know, but so they're, they're trying to work through that while also, you know, having, you know, lovey dovey hug kiss time. Um, that's what, that's what normal people call it, right? That's, I was told, I was 10. Yes. Lovey dovey kiss. Okay. Um, just to make sure I'm not the, I'm not the weird one. Sheesh. Um, so, you know, they're, they're getting intimate, not necessarily sexy times, but they're certainly, you know, putting tongues in faces and um 
Is that not what's happening? Am I mis- Am I misinterpreting? Okay. No, it is. No, they totally are. It was just funny. I thought it was funny. Trying to be like, uh, like a coroner investigator saying exactly what happens. You're good. You're good. He put his tongue in her face. She put her tongue in his face. <laughs> yes. And then there was he weird, gross, disgusting blood all over the fucking room because reasons. Mm-hmm. And life is awful. Um, no, they're kissing and enjoying each other's kissy kisses. Yes. Um, I'm clearly, I'm very, I'm a romantic guy. Over here. Yeah, appreciating um, what they're doing. Um, and then she gets out a bag and she hands him some clean clothes, which is kind and lovely. And she dresses uh, him, which is like, 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 like banana sexy. <laughs> um, and then, um, he talks about that also because. <laughs> He's not wrong. And then Tara knocks on the door and says, wizard, it is time. He stood up, but she grabbed his wrist and said, wait a minute. I was going to give you this for your birthday. Do we know what month this is? It's October, right? So. Okay, so it's almost his birthday. But I thought you could use it. I tilted my, my head and took in the box. It was heavy. What is it? Just open it, dummy. She answered, smile, smiling up at me. I did. And inside was a smell of soft worked leather, sensuous and thick. That's a weird way to describe leather. Yeah. Wrapped up in translucent paper. I tossed the lid aside, took the paper off, and found the dark leather, new and matte black, hardly casting back the light. I like that description. Nice. I took it out of the box and it unfolded into a heavy, long coat, like my own duster in design, even to the mantle around the shoulders and arms but all made of the finer material. I love it. Oh, yeah. So when I say this dust, the, the duster, quote unquote, is a part of his identity. This is even cooler. This is the duster we're talking about. Okay. This, not like a fucking canvas fucking trench coat. <laughs> this, this ain't no trench coat. This is a motherfucking wizard's duster. Uh-huh. It's pretty sweet. He says, it must cost you a fortune. She laughed wickedly and said, yeah, but I got to wear it around naked just to feel it on my skin. <laughs> Why you to have it, Harry? Something from me. For luck. So he, he puts on the coat. He grabs the uh, gun that he took from Harris. Why all the gingers are bad. We're going to have some good gingers in the show or I'm going to quit, quit and start <laughs> my own novel series. We're a much maligned people. Um, he's ready to go. And he, he turned to say goodbye to Susan and he found her stepping into her clothes. Uh, what are you doing? Getting dressed. Why? Someone's got to drive the van, Dresden. She calls him Dresden and not Harry. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. It doesn't matter. Well, in this moment, in this moment, she does that. That's the moment you would think, I guess, because she's now no longer his girlfriend. Now she's someone who, shut the fuck up, I'm coming. Yep. 100%. So now she's she's the reporter now, and he's the wizard. Okay, no, I like that. That's interesting. I love it. Um, I, I I noted it, but I didn't really get it. And that's no, you're right. Mm-hmm. You're very clever. Um, uh, besides, this could be the biggest paranormal event I've ever had the chance to cover. Do you expect me to stay behind? <laughs> she pushed the door up. I love this. She goes out the door first. She pushed the door open and gave him a look. Um, and so she heads to the door, and he now he's pissed. He's got one more person to worry about. She doesn't even have a gun. Say, well, I, I get it, but like, yeah, he gives her the same rules that he gave Billy. Like, I'm in charge. If you listen to me, you can go. If you don't, get the fuck out of here. And she pursed her lips and narrowed her eyes and said, I kind of like the sound of that. <laughs> oh, she is just toying with him. Um, and he'll allow it. Uh, she said, I like that look on you too. Have you ever thought about growing a beard? Goodness. <laughs> She's just referencing your favorite version of Harry. Obviously. Yeah. Um, Fucking annoying. So she'd stay away from the worst of it. If I had a tire to the van myself, I grumble. I muttered something grouchy. <laughs> 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 and he got dressed. Um, I just love it. Um, he caught the sight of himself in the mirror. And my double, the one from the dream, stared back at me. Only the roughness of the three-day growth of dark whispers, whiskers and the bruises were at contrast with the subconscious me's neatly trimmed beard. Everything else was precisely the same. I turned my face away rather quickly and paced from the room. 
out to the van where the others are waiting. So die. Hashtag cliffhanger! Whoa, whoa! It's not a great cliffhanger, but it's better than the other ones, I think. Yeah, no, totally, totally. I mean, that's there's so much that would happen in these couple chapters. It's like, woo. Yeah. But I love it. It was it's a lot of progress and it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean it was you know, obviously chapter twenty um one, which I did with, with you know, Parker was certainly that fight was, you know, there's some action and then at the full moon garage, but even that conversation, you know, at the full moon garage there wasn't a whole lot of actual action. Like stuff yeah. Stuff was happening. But it wasn't what you would, you know, wasn't an act. I mean, it was an action scene, but I I don't know how to describe it (laughs) accurately. Like it was clearly an action scene, but Harry was kind of adjacent to most of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he was the observer. Exactly. What we got to do, any, any quick questions, recap, whatever you have on it. Um... So my biggest questions were um, regarding um, Hendrix's ability to move quickly. The all of the tires and the motorcycles went flat, and so perhaps I don't know. Marconi's not ne- not human, um, <laughs> but, it, but that was those are the biggest things um, that that you know that I saw and that I noticed and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I I certainly can't speak to. I don't think I can speak to either of those ideas necessarily um yeah i mean certainly interesting i think it's kind of the best we got Uh on both counts yeah i mean there's so much going on there there was a lot of development where but there's still so many questions you know what i mean like it's just so absolutely and i mean a lot of it is very much not super clear and not super you know no um, which is good and interesting, but um, it, this, you know, Hendrix moves fast. He's a, he's a bodyguard for one of the scariest motherfuckers alive or not alive, as the case may be, right? So, yeah. Uh, why wouldn't he move fast? He's he's going to be a good bodyguard. You know what I mean? So I, yeah, exactly. But so I don't really think that is necessarily interesting. Maybe noteworthy. Maybe, but I think that has at best has to be put a pin in it. Yeah, no, that's definitely, there's a pin put there. There's definitely a pin. I mean, you know, Marcone moving fast. Again, yeah. You mentioned Marcone. (laughs) Marcone driving is being like super. It's just out of character. It's not, it's not super like, oh my God, but it is out of character. Out of, I was pointing, you know, I wanted to point out out of character moments. No, it's, it's not, I would say it's out of norm. The norm for his care. Um. It's out of his habit, out of habit. Sure. It's out of- no, I mean, the only time we've seen, we, you, you said he always gets your, we've seen him in the car one time, right? So now we've seen him twice. So Twice. We've seen him twice in a car. I thought he was in a car, the back of a car, nothing. I may be wrong. But, but what I'm saying is that like, so half the time we've seen him, he's driving and half the time he's not. Now. No, well, I thought, I don't know. I thought we'd saw him in the back of a car twice, oh, but I could not oh, Just the one time. Okay. So, okay. so, I mean, you don't usually sit in the back of a limo with, your thug, you know, multiple thugs and a driver, and to drive a truck into a, a hot zone. So you're you're yeah. absolutely right. Your uh, your your thought is correct. Um, but we don't have a ton of evidence for what he does outside of that. And this is very much a special case. And the options are, Hendricks drives and Marcode is in the back, shooting and being shot yeah. at. Yeah. Or Marcode drives and Hendricks is the one being shot at and shooting. So I, I think it makes sense that he's doing that. It's certainly interesting, though, because it does prove that this is a a fucking dire issue, for sure. But yeah, no, it's very interesting on that front, for sure. I don't think any I can have any meaningful conversations without being spoilery or anti-spoilery on either of the other stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I, honestly, any, like, we do, I mean, we do the recap breakdown and the analysis as we go, obviously, because we're human beings talking about stuff. But yeah, um, do you have any, like, you know? other thoughts that didn't come up during the breakdowns or i don't know i i i they were you know i mean the everything i literally wrote notes for your chapters to be like okay these are things that are important um because that like the most significant thing that i noticed uh within the realm of these chapters was that tara respects his 
uh, powers so much so that you know she backed down uh in chapter 26 or chapter 25 about you know like i'm gonna be in charge you're all not coming or i'm being gonna be in charge so that was kind of cool but that's really the biggest thing that i have going on right now yeah i, I and again specifically in the moment where he has no real power he has no wi- sorry he has no wizarding power like he has no yeah at that moment but it, oh, in general she still respects his power. no that's what i'm saying that that's i think that's even more impressive in a moment where he has no wiz- yeah. wizarding power She's showing him this much respect. I think that's yeah, and I I appreciate very it. very I very it. powerful. Yeah, it's great. It's amazing. Yikes! There were, we we had this discussion. There's not much yikes. I didn't feel much yikes in this in this section. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. No, not at all. And honestly, the I, I, this is like uh damning with faint praise i guess or (laughs) there's a moment where he's standing there and there's a fucking hot naked 20 year old girl and he says nothing about it in the in the alley when the wolves change like georgia from what we understand georgia's like smoke it she's a smoke show yeah it sounds like that and so we have and she turns from wolf to she becomes herself and we have this like 20 something completely nude gal and Harry doesn't sexualize her at all. I mean, I, I clearly no, I, it's my, right. literally my description of the situation is sexualizing her more than Harry did. Um, uh, yeah, you know, we do what we can. We do our best. Um, but like, I, that's like really interesting that he doesn't, again, he's distressed. He's in, yeah, he's back, you know, like, but he's done that before, but he has zero, there's zero sexuality in that in that alleyway, and there's a bunch of like naked young people. I don't know. It's, it's just interesting, certainly. No, it is, and that. In, in, but it's it says a lot about Harry. What does it say about Harry? That he's not like he's not uh, bringing these these females that are nude, these naked wolves that have turned their human form down to a sexualized being it's pretty cool yeah no it's very interesting i'm i'm i, I was certainly surprised by it but I, not in a bad way but anyways. oh no it's it's a it's a good surprise awesome yeah no that's i mean i like that this part didn't have a lot of yikes yeah it's great yeah like how much interaction with women were there not a ton you know um yeah, right the ones he was interacting with you know, obviously the you know the scene with Susan is very sexual, but yeah. not in a yikes. But it's not potential. A, yeah, not in a yikes way. Exactly. You know, we talked. We touched on this last time. Like people are allowed to think about sex. Like sex is allowed to be yes. out of life. Um, you know, like you're allowed to have sex as a part of your thought process. Yeah, it just it's a consensual. It's that you know where you're not you're not dehumanizing exactly. something as a sexual object. Exactly. That's the big thing. The deal. consent and the, you know, there are human being first, there are sexual being second needs to be the norm in most cases. Um, there are situations where actually that's appropriate, you know, but that is neither here nor there. But like, the you know, most of the time you're, you're walking down the street, like they're human beings who might be pretty and that pretty human beings. Yeah. I like, I like pretty human beings as much as the next guy. I like attractive human beings too. Sure. You know, but they need to be you need to recognize the hierarchy there that human being pretty sexual you know what i mean you have to treat them like humans though Ugh. they're not just such as the hardest the hardest you. part of life is just treating other people <laughs> like that. um it's not or at least it shouldn't be but it is what it is but um yeah i mean i it was it's it's tough to say this is yikes list because there wasn't really opportunities to be yikesy besides that yeah and that's very true but that that was so that was certainly one opportunity where he really yeah. could have been gross like which is great like, think of how gross he could have been and that's it like how gross were you i would like me knowing that that scene happened imagine how gross i was expecting it to be yeah and then there was none of that <laughs> it's a major victory for the good guys so i'm proud i'm proud of harry and jim in that moment yeah no it was great i it, it really was i appreciate it absolutely so 
Um, I guess, I mean, we go to a, a quote of the week. What do you got? All right. I have a couple. But my favorite, I have two. The, my number one is I wasn't dead yet. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, it was pretty on point, let's be honest. I mean, it, it just was. And the other one, they're both, they're, they're both very different. If I was going to die here, I was going to lay out a curse on Marcone that would make the grimmest of fairy t- old fairy tales you ever heard sound like pleasant daydreams. Jesus Christ. That's a curse and a half, and I fucking love it. Oh, yeah, no, that's... But there, it's just two, the two ends of the spectrum for me. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> it's just a top out. But my favorite, honestly, was this like, I tried to use it last week. And my wonderful sister informed me that no, 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 that wasn't that wasn't in this. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's not a Ron Texas day. That was not in this chunk of chunk of the book. Uh, but when <laughs> Harry says it never rains, and Tara frowned at me and said, "It's raining now." I love that. She turned to Susan. I do not think he is coherent. <laughs> I love so that. Stupid. It's so stupid. And that whole scene is. It's great. so stupid. I realize it's stupid, and that's the one. But it's still great. Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. <laughs> it can be stupid and wonderful, and it really is. Um, <laughs> uh, I just think it's great. Uh, no, it's great. And it's just, it's entertaining. It's a, she, her lack of a, awareness of, like, the colloquialisms is oh, spectacular. Yeah, and, and it, it, yeah, it's great. And my, my second one is, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you'll, you'll understand later why I love the, love these things, but, like, that... Georgia clucked her teeth, annoyed, and said, you shouldn't have gone for his hamstring on that wolf. He was too fast. Billy flashed her a grin. I almost got him, though. <laughs> <laughs> that is still pretty good. Right. That, like, that's just like, oh, I, fu- I fucking almost had him. <laughs> yeah, for, for real. So, uh, ooh, here's a new one that we probably will reference plenty of times. The end of the, the, the first street race in Fast and Furious. When... Uh-huh. Wait, Paul Walker's, you know, car's on fire or whatever. He's like, I almost had you, though. <laughs> He's like, you almost had me? <laughs> whether you win by an inch or a mile, I know, whatever. I am also unabash- oh. unabashedly in love with the Fast and Furious uh, series. Yes, he is. Although, I didn't like Nine. I thought Nine was too, cartoon- too cartoonish. And if you think that is a ridiculous thing to say about a cartoonish series... You're both <laughs> right and also mostly right. But it got, it got <laughs> over the top. It got over the top in, in nine. All the rest of them were so fucking great. Um, either way. Uh, um, yeah, the, I, I almost had him, though. Oh, I, I fucking almost had him. <laughs> that, Billy and George. Remember, Billy and Georgia were fighting at the yeah. end of the novel. And now she's, like, worried about him and, like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. He's like, yeah, but I fucking almost got it. I, <laughs> uh, that was almost my number one, but the terror quote is just so good. Like, uh, it is raining now. <laughs> yes, yeah, so spectacular. Oh, goodness. All right. Um, well, um, we're just about out of here on hour number seven of the podcast. Um, Ice, do you have uh, a crackpot theory this week? Or are we just going to like... Yes, and I have quotes to back it up. There's just continue to wax poetic on Marcone being... He, I mean, I still think that's true, but this 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 uh chunk actually proved some of it. But anyway, <laughs> what do um, you got? What do you got? Okay, so there are a couple quotes that made me question that this is supposed to be like him writing a diary or a journal. So at one point he says, "I know, I know, it sounds really stupid in retrospect, even to me." And then a page later, he says, don't look at me like that. I'm telling you, it made sense to me. At the time. Uh... And a little while later, he starts saying, did I ever tell you about my dad? And goes into this whole thing that we already know. He already told us. But did I ever tell you about my dad? He's speaking to some. Wait, when was that? This is it. Uh, it's page 258. <laughs> okay. In what chapter is this? Chapter 22, I think. But he says, did I ever tell you about my dad? He was a magician. Not a wizard, mind you, but a magician. The kind you see at old-fashioned magic shows. And then, uh, you know, he goes, I was really young when he died and all of this. This is contemporaneous. He's not writing this as a diary or a journal. He's telling this story to someone. 
this is an I bet this is the worst possible reference I could possibly make, but the only one I could think. This is a how I met your mother motherfucking <laughs> bullshit situation. And it irritated me so much when I figured this out. I was like, hmm. Are you talking about he's gonna he's gonna marry Aunt Murphy? Motherfucker. Like I was just like, did they ever tell you about my dad? Oh my god. Like, cause like for it's all the first show, I was like, that don't really fit, but maybe it's just a writing error. And then this whole two and a half page thing or page and a half thing where I'm like, oh my God, he's telling us a story. So it is called the Dresden Files. So he could still be writing it down later. Yes, but this is not. He's telling a story. Okay. Yeah. I dig it. No, I like the idea. That's interesting. Yeah. It, this is, uh, it's weird because the first person narrative does kind of, the first person, uh, what's it? Like the present day first person narrative does break. Contemporaneous. Yeah, it's it's not contemporaneous in some of those chapters, right? Because like, no, that's the thing. Oh, we're che- we these moments have have taken away from that. Yeah, most most of the series is I'm doing this. This happened. Murphy did this. I did this. This did yeah. that. Da, da, da. But then when he says, yeah, when he says shit like the, that, that's fucking interesting. I don't know. Okay, 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 okay. Do you think it's he's telling the story when he realizes that Marcone and Hendrix are actually demons? He starts telling the story, or oh, I think maybe I think he maybe already knows, but he doesn't want to reveal to the the person he's telling the story to. But they have to have souls because he's soul gazed. So do demons have souls? I don't know all the rules. They said uh, creatures from the never never do not have souls. Okay, so he's the, he can't be a demon, but he can be some sort of like whatever the fuck Terra is. Well, Tara's not. Tara doesn't have a soul, so he might be a partial demon or some sort of mag- magic wait, creature. Wait, why does he need to have soul gaze somebody? Macone has to have a soul. Oh, Marcone, yeah, Marcone has a soul. We know that because they soul. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm not telling you. I, I need like a, a a map a board on my wall in here in my little den with red strings going to like Marcone and the different characteristics and stuff. You don't watch Always Sunny, but there's a... Uh... I know exactly what you're talking about. I do watch Always Sunny. I haven't watched it in a while, but I know exactly. Oh, yeah. sure, when, I love Always Sunny. Charlie Kelly's running the mail room, and he's he trying to figure out where all the mail is going. Like... Yes. But it's it, but that's why I think Danny DeVito should star in everything. Oh, no. Danny DeVito, as every character, is the best version yeah. of this show. Um, 100%. I, I call this a show and a movie all the time, and I mean it, because yeah. in my mind... It is a show. That's what's... It's running through your head like a show. I get it. 100%. But yeah, no, and that's my that's my craft bar theory of the day. I love it. That's where we're at. He's telling someone a story. Well, who's he telling, and why is it in a book? Uh, I don't know. How I met your mother. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Promise it wasn't Aunt Murphy's fault. Uh, you know, I don't think it was. <laughs> no, I dig it. That's a great one. I, I that's fucking out of the blue, and I love it. <laughs> But I have big research to back it up. That's the problem. I like when he, I like when he gets you get shifty with it. It's fucking awesome. I mean, well, I have two graduate degrees based on research, so I'm like, ooh, research and reading. And not a grad degree based on writing, making shit up. Yeah, ex- well, that's that's the funny thing. Like my undergraduate degree is in playwriting. Yeah, and so it's, it is making shit up, but it's still writing. Oh, I, I, so I'm making. Which is why the story concepts make so much sense to me. Oh, I didn't mean that in a derogatory way. I meant. Oh no, I didn't think you did. You you get to make shit. Make you get a, you have a great mem- idea to make shit up, and then you get to fucking research and figure it out. I, I <laughs> that was that, that was we just really did. That was complimentary. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I know I didn't take it to anything, but but it is funny because it's just like my the two sides where I have the it's the fuck around and find out where it's just like. I fuck around and make up stories, and then I find out and get all the information. Should should like it's should we tell the audience that it took you five years to graduate from undergrad, though? It took me three years, except for one class, because this College of Letters and Sciences fucked up. They told me I was done it, but I had one GE, and so I took mm. intro to psych on Camp Pendleton. Mm. Didn't buy the book. Didn't study. Mm. Got an A plus. Well, all I know is it only took me four years to graduate my undergrad, so. All your how about your master's degree? All your fancy post graduate. I didn't need them because I graduated in four years. I didn't need I didn't need to flex after taking five years. <laughs> but let me tell you, studying for studying psychology on a military base is interesting. I actually didn't graduate. Uh, I mean, I graduated. I walked, but I had I because I was. What's the thing where you drink lots of beer and don't go to class? 
that I was drunk. I was drunk a lot. College student. I was a college student a lot. And so I actually, I went in with all these goddamn AP classes and then finished two classes shy. At the end. So I got to walk and I had to do online classes. I did take two online classes that summer, but I took them that summer. And so I graduated the same year instead of two years later. Like you did. No, well, we didn't know until almost nine months later that yeah. I was working in LA. Yeah. So it was like, the fuck? So it took you five years to graduate and that's fine. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'm so, I, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you for making it work. You're such a dick. <laughs> not, not, but not, both of my, both of my graduate degrees, what is a three-year degree that I got in a year and what is a three-year degree I got in 10 months? You got one from England. That doesn't even fucking count. It totally counts. How many, how many stone is it worth? <laughs> stone is weight, by the way. I'm well aware. It's like 14 <laughs> pounds or some bullshit. Uh, how many pounds sterling is one stone? Oh, goodness gracious. Fuck them all. Um, <laughs> she got, don't worry, friends. She does have an actual American degree that we recognize on the podcast. I have multiple American degrees, unfortunately. <laughs> the podcast was on fire, does not recognize international master's degrees. <laughs> But, but the United but the United States Department of Education does, so <laughs> she's a huge Biden. Huge Biden. <laughs> Saying that is great because it makes like ninety percent of people think, Oh yeah, he's on my side. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, I'm probably not if you don't if you think Biden's the worst. You just, if you listen to this podcast. Yeah, if you listen for twelve seconds, you know exactly right. <laughs> Have I said said A C A B yet this this podcast? And you've used propaganda a couple times. Not this one. No, no, this episode. I need to squeeze it in every time. Um, that's a real <laughs> Easter egg, not the stuff after the end. Um, all right. Um, all right. We got our quotes of the week. You got your, your dealie. Uh, we're going to delete almost all of this. And luckily, it's out of order. So I'm going to take fucking years and a half to delete it all. So any parting thoughts here? We are uh, obviously. No, I think I'm good. This is uh, an interesting uh, you know, cl- climax here. We're. we're we're heading out to Marcone's homestead, which is cool. I'm actually interested for you to see where Marcone lives and operates from. And um, fucking Harry Dresden, clever as they come, bound the goddamn Loop Guru to him. So when Harry goes, the Loop Guru is going to come find him. And uh, it'll be exciting. So it's going to be a really cool uh, last episode. I'm very... Very, very interested to see how some of these last few interactions go. Again, based on what we've learned about all of this shit, I'm fucking, I'm really excited to see this progression here. So, um, yeah, man, I, I, I'm pumped. I, I'm excited. Rock and roll. Uh, I, I do want to give a shout out to my dude on Reddit. Uh, last week we, uh, you know, we, we mentioned that we, we had that three star review and we wanted to, you know, we just wanted to know why. And uh, my dude, or, you know, so just so we're clear, when I say dude, I live, I grew up in Southern California. Dude is a noun, verb, adjective, has no gender. Uh, it's a dude, lady, dude, whatever, it's a dude. Uh, but Dragon Fett is the dude on, I, I, just, I hope I'm not throwing you under the bus. I, I just really want to want to up you, dude. Um, you know, I, I was wondering, uh, we mentioned our three-star review last week. He's like, hey, he told us why, because he couldn't leave a review on Spotify. So he, he sent me a message, uh, you know, our audio sucks. Yeah, our audio sucks. Because our audio editor sucks. Alyssa. Oh, no, wait, no, wait. Who does the audio editing here? Not me. Oh, yeah, no, it, it's, yeah, no, it, it's not Lissy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's atrocious. I'm, I'm a work in progress. I, I, I literally downloaded it. I downloaded Audacity after we recorded our first episode. I'm trying to figure it out. So, no, but it was just, like, again, I, I don't, not literally not throwing this dude on the bus. I'm like, I want to up you, Jagged Fett, because you're super cool, because the fact that you reached out and told us what we need to do better, I, the, the audio quality wasn't good enough. So, um, I'm doing my best to try to figure that out. I know it sounds like I'm lying, because Full Moon had some issues, number two. Yeah. But, um, no, I I think we're great, mostly because Lissy carries this show on her back. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm I'm Yoda. And she just flips over the trees and stuff. And I, just, <laughs> I say some wise stuff and I hit her with a stick is kind of how it goes. Um, but I'm just like, I, I'm just excited that people want, you know, to be around. So, um, yeah, but no, that, that dude just like telling it, you know, he literally like, hey, no, that was me. Here's why. It was fucking cool shit. Super rad. 
I love it. Thanks oh. for listening. We do appreciate it. And we love that you guys were reviewing. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's awesome. The, the best thing you can do is give us a review of any star number, mostly fives, but any star number on you know Amazon or, or Apple or... Wherever you in- listen to your podcast. Wherever you listen to your podcast. Podcentral.ca. But it's free. It helps us out. And, you know, leave us a review or we got a, a thread on the, the Dresden Files subreddit, which is kind of our de facto message board. It's good times. The podcast is on fire at, at gmail.com. And we also have a TikTok, which is mostly me releasing a video every week or so saying, hey, our video is out. And like 12 people watch it. Um, you wouldn't want to like a fat ginger yelling about the <laughs> podcast either, but you know. We're also um, on Twitter, and I'm really bad about Twitter. I'm sorry. She's in charge of Twitter, so I'm about Twitter charge. yelling her. Uh, I apologize, but uh, on Twitter, we are The Pod Was On Fire. The Pod Was On Fire. Everything else where the podcast was on fire. But we didn't have enough numbers, or numbers, uh, d- uh, characters, so. We got plenty of characters, but I'm... Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. Why aren't we famous? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me send you that video of me doing karaoke the other night, and I'll tell you all. I, uh, all our Patreon members get access to this video <laughs> of my sister doing karaoke. Um, honestly, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you. Uh, hit us up on any of the fucking socials, all the social things that kids do these days. Uh, yeah, this book. I, I can't believe I don't hate this book. I, I've hated this book. Since this book existed, and apparently I don't hate it anymore, so weird. But uh, I'm excited about the uh, finale here coming up, and really to get my sister onto the books that don't suck. <laughs> and this book apparently doesn't suck. But we're gonna we're gonna hit the meat and potatoes here real quick. So uh, thanks thanks for sitting around, guys. We appreciate you. Uh, this one's going to come out on Sunday because I will make it. Oh God, I'm fucking four games this weekend. It's gonna come out on Sunday. So I'll make it come out on Sunday. <laughs> Um, I've been Josh. I'm Alyssa. And really, the podcast was on fire. And it wasn't my fault. One of my friends sent me, just sent me this, and it's a um, picture of Buffalo Bill. Roses are for vases, lotions for the skin. You will be my Valentine, or you'll get the hose again. Huh. You. This one's for you, sport, he tells me. <laughs>